You're listening to a Pop House Network podcast for developers by developers. Okay. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Stack Podcast episode number 74, recorded on August 30th, 2024. Uh, I'm your host, Keto Man, with all three co hosts. Woohoo! Woohoo! Royal Flush. Yes. So we've got Daniel Inahosa, Josh Juno, and and Ian Lavitz. Woohoo! It's, it's a minor we found miracle. Him. We found him. <laughs> yes, we have found the Lavitz. <laughs> I was hiding on a beach looking for Zoom virtual backgrounds. You I guys know. finally yeah, finally found him. <laughs> we were uh, yeah, we were all trying to hunt for uh, Ian, and then we heard faintly uh, some Spanish guitar on the beach, and we're like, I think we got him. And uh, <laughs> we got him. We dragged him over, and now he's a part of this it. podcast. I couldn't resist the call to join you guys on the Zoom podcast. So our, our, our you know, our ritual continues. So the streak is not unbroken, but uh, temporarily interrupted. Let's say. Yes, <laughs> yes, that that works. That works. Great so, to have everyone. Yeah, definitely. Um, so anyone who uh, listens to this regularly may have noticed that we disappeared for a few months, but that happens with us occasionally. Um, so so, so uh, we li- re- we originally had planned to have an episode, actually record the episode in June, um, and it is now August. Um, so uh, between some uh, family health issues and summer, um, we uh, ended up sort of uh, delaying things, but we're glad to be back. Uh, so... Um, and uh, I, I guess we could say how things have been. My summer was not that great because of family health issues, but it got better, um, which is good. Um, and uh, I don't know how how you, how was your summer, guys? That's, yeah, it was good. Went quick. It's been good. You know, a lot of family time, a lot of travel. Actually, uh, visiting, going back and forth, visiting family, and uh, you know, definitely put in some beach time. So I'm I'm pretty happy with the way things have been going. The summer, never enough uh, beach time, but uh, definitely a few nice, uh, nice outings. So things have been good. Thanks for asking, guys. Your, your family is in. Was this family in Canada? Actually, yeah, I was in, back in Canada for a couple of weeks, and my family came over here to Spain to visit me for a little while oh, as nice. well. So, nice. Yeah, it was uh, it was nice. You know, I had like uh, my parents visiting, my sister and and her family came to visit. So it was great. We got to uh, you know go go to some of our favorite spots. Uh, you know. Uh, seaside restaurants and places like that, so it was fun. Right, uh, were you in a place? I heard that, like for Spain, uh, that they were uh, uh, giving tourists a hard time just because of the uh, yeah. they were causing that's... disruptions in the housing market or something. Well, more it's more than just that, but yeah, I mean that's not just in Spain. I mean Italy too. Like this, it's just saturated. I think since COVID, there's been like these waves of kind of revenge tourism, like people just going like hardcore. We're going to we're going to Italy. We're going to Spain. We're going to France, wherever, and doing big European vacations and like just flooding. You know, popular Greece is the same thing. Like Santorini, all these places get flooded with a lot of tourists. So, yeah, the, the, it puts a lot of pressure on the locals because, like, well, for one, yes, it does drive up. You know, uh, housing, housing prices. Mm-hmm. A lot of people who own houses turn them into our Airbnb vacation rentals, and that drives up rental prices and so on. But it's also just accessing the city. Like it's, uh, it becomes very difficult to just commute for pe- people who live in those cities. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, go go back and forth from home to the city and wherever they they live to wherever they work, right? So yeah, there was some there was some like water pistols fired at some tourists in a, at, at some cafe in Barcelona. But <laughs> yeah. you know, it was, I don't think it was intended to, uh, to to hurt anyone. But yeah, there's definitely some frustration. But yeah, it's. Sure. Uh, that's a trade off of living in a beautiful city, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah. definitely. Yep. Yeah. So make your city ugly is our. Uh, <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah. Guys. Come on. Uh, summer is great. You know, I, I just have a little small complaint about summer. Um, I know the temperatures have gone up, but I also, you know, for, I, don't, I don't think that 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 much, uh, but they have gone up. And also, I've gotten older. I just remember as a kid, like everything was more exciting in the summer just because you had a lot more fun things to do. Uh, and it was exciting for you. Like, I don't think it's exciting for me anymore just because I'm over 50. <laughs> so also, like the heat really bears down on you the older you get, I think. Yeah. Uh, and so summers ain't what it used to be. And that's OK. You know, I'll accept that I'm older, but I just thought I'd just lay that out. <laughs> I think that's fair. 
So yeah. Josh, you said you've been busy. Yeah, just lots of uh, running around in the summer trying to get projects done and things like that. But we're just, uh, we didn't really take any trips this year. We went up north fishing for a week. And uh, then the last few weeks have just been all about getting all the kids back in school, getting everything together. So yeah. it's been busy recently, but things things went well. Are, you, are your kids are back in school now? Yeah, they're all back in school. Wow. They've been Amazing. in school for a couple of weeks now. Wow. Yeah, ours ours started last week too. So they 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 seem to just jack it up earlier all the time. <laughs> so uh, I was gonna say one thing. Oh yeah, I didn't do we didn't do a summer vacation this year because our our the family we normally vacation with wasn't available. Um, and I didn't think I would care, but I actually I really miss it because I I just the the way that it forces you to mentally disconnect from everything. I think is useful, even though it's not necessarily as relaxing when you have kids and stuff. Um, but just just the mentally being away, I think mm -hmm. it's good. So yeah. But um I actually want to move on and introduce our special guests. Um, and that would be Linny. Is it Primac? I forgot to ask you this Pre before. It's okay. Premac. 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 Okay. Linny Premac, who is, oh, is, who is pretty good. Good okay. enough. Close enough? Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I generally get about 80% there. Close enough. Prima. Good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, so, um, good. so Lenny is a longtime listener and um, a, a popular name in, in terms of uh, open source contributions. We see him all over the place. Um, and I, I asked him to put a bio on our show notes, and he put this really descriptive bio here. It says, uh, a guy in Nebraska maintaining open source software. <laughs> and then I went to the website. Software. Yeah, I went to a website to get get a, a better uh, overview, a uh, better synopsis, and I didn't get one. <laughs> so, so Lenny, um, it's, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, and thank you very uh, much. Appreciate all you guys. Well, Great podcast. Tell us, tell us about yourself. Like, um, I, I, well, I'll, I'll let you tell you tell us. I was going to say, you know, a couple of things, but. But yeah, like, um, what, how, how are you, like, what do you focus on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, what do you do with open source? Um, and yeah, tell us about yourself. Uh, well, um, I've been working, you know, in software since I was about uh, uh, 17 years old. And uh, until about 2007 is when I kind of switched careers. I became a professional pilot. And I did do some software consulting on the side. Uh, uh, and I really started contributing to open source software back starting in about 2011 and really cranked it, cranked it up in 2016 until now. And now since I'm, I'm, a, I'm a charter private jet pilot now, and I've got a lot of free time on my hands. So I just do as a you know public service, I guess, these days, uh, contributions to open source software. Cool. Basically, a lot of it is Jakarta EE related or adjacent, and I absolutely, absolutely love it. I think uh, Jakarta EE is a great ecosystem, and anything that touches it, uh, Java in general, really is is fantastic, and I really enjoy just doing it out of my own accord with no deadlines and. Uh, improving basically improving the the world by trying to you know add to it right nice that was awesome all right so so here's here's an, an obvious question um are so is your charter pilot work is that enough to support you like or are you semi-retired or what <laughs> that's a good question um, I, I certainly sorry, made a I'm lot less money much. when I was working on for Wall Street banks. No, okay. it's 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 good. I, I, uh, I mean, my wife works and I work, and we have uh, some other, you know, we have we have a rental property that we rent out. So, uh, and we also live in Nebraska, so it's not that uh, not the, the expense base is not that much. We are neither of us are spending super extra money on you know some things. We only have one child. Sorry, Josh. <laughs> That's right. So we don't. <laughs> All right. So we don't have to 
spend millions of dollars on the on, on, on the on the children. We only have one child, so it's only uh, you know one one fifth the cost. <laughs> right. So so uh, what uh, uh, what uh, we're okay. What, uh, what airfields do you uh, fly out of? Do you fly out of Epley? Nope, Lincoln Lincoln Airport most of the time. Oh, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Okay. Cool, yeah, cool, cool. yeah, yeah. We live. Uh, me and my uh, wife and my daughter live in Lincoln, and we love it. It's a great city. It's certainly different from Nick where I grew up, but uh, it's a great place to raise a family, and uh, we love it. Nice. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And the commute's yeah. about fifteen minutes to the airport, which is great. Oh, yeah, that's, that's the bad. best part. And then from Omaha, it looks like what? Maybe uh, an hour. Drive? Yeah, it's an hour from Omaha. Uh, okay. Trust me, after having 15 minute commute back and forth, sometimes you have to drive to Omaha and it's a drag. Yeah. <laughs> I know, tough life. I, I, but it I looks like if you life, need a really, really big city, there's either Denver, Chicago, or Minneapolis. That's probably uh, an hour flight from Lincoln, then, right? Yeah, but an hour, an hour and a half ish. Yeah. Yeah. Although okay. last time, Last time me and my wife flew to Denver on vacation, it took us six hours door to door. No, oh. more than that. Nine hours door to door with flight really? delays and all delays. that stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So you never know. You never yeah. know. That's why a lot of people do the charter out of Nebraska because it really takes forever to get really anywhere. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. I get it now. All right. Well, very cool. Mm -hmm. Anything powered by Java on your airplane? I don't think so. I, uh, oh, okay. I mean, I've never flown a new airplane in my life. And our airplane's about 20 years old. Uh, so it's all probably sea-based and uh, uh, green screen type deals. Right. <laughs> the classics. Yeah. Yes. So, so. Yeah, we... it's all, it's all classic stuff. So on the programming side, how did you, like what, did you, when you were doing a lot of financial stuff, was it mostly Java? Like what made you attracted to contributing like to, to Jakarta EE and products like that? Well, most of the stuff that I did uh, on Wall Street was actually C++. Ah, okay. And uh, Java came in a little bit later, but it wasn't like the main thrust of the efforts. And uh, I've got, I don't know if you ever guys remember those C++ days, you know, you write mm -hmm. your program and it's great and it works and it crashes in production or you start doing some optimization flags and then it starts crashing. So when you write your program, you're like about 10% done. And then and sometimes you just, you know, if you have a distributed system in C++, you, there's sometimes it, it, it just goes to the place where you can't just find the bugs all the bugs you just can't find them and you get so frustrating that's kind of my experience with c++ it just at the end of the day if i were to say if i were to give an opinion like a like a hard opinion c++ does not work in production because it's all it just keeps your programs just keep crashing at the, the very inopportune moments and that's why i think java is way better in that respect because mm -hmm. uh, Java is uh, just, you deploy it in production. And if you've written it correctly, it mostly works. Yeah, you may have a crash or two, not a crash, but some kind of bug. But usually that's easy to debug and, and fix. Yeah. So. No, I and I think there was the a directive uh, from, uh, uh, from the White House on like not using C++. And maybe I'll bring that up in the links because I don't think we've talked about that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, computer languages without automatic memory management uh, should not be used in, in uh, many of the government situations. I forgot what it was. I'm really paraphrasing it, but I'll find, I'll find that actual directive for that same reason. Uh, and uh, yeah, and we should talk yeah. about quickly about CrowdStrike if anyone uh, had, had, has uh, been held yeah. back as well, but I'll bring that directive up. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, the CrowdStrike thing. Um, what was I going to say? Um, so, so I, I've seen you in a, in a few different uh, Jakarta E related projects, but what which open source projects do you contribute to? Uh, Jakarta E APIs I've recently contributed to. Mm -hmm. uh, I've contributed to uh, 
Jakarta Faces. I've contributed to Payara. I actually worked for Payara for a few years. Hmm. I remember Um, that, yeah. yeah. And yeah, I did some consulting for Payara. And uh, I, I, I love it. It's great. Uh, Apache Shiro, I've contributed to that. Uh, there's a, there, there, it's a long list. I, That's I contributed what it's kind of what to I Maven. thought. That, 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 that's why I mentioned it because I was like, I was like, I think there's a lot of different projects you've contributed Yeah, to. Omni, uh, Omni Faces, Prime Faces. Uh, the, the list is, I've even did some JavaScript stuff too. Uh, not, not too much, but, but what, what's, what's Jakarta, Jakarta EE, what really, Uh, it, it attracted me to that is the clean separation of API and implementation. You just include the API and your all of your your application is very, very light and all of the heavy lifting is done by somebody else so I don't have to worry about it. Because for example, in Spring Boot, although everybody says Spring Boot is great and I don't necessarily disagree, but what Spring Boot does, it brings all the dependencies in to your application And if you, for example, if you have to upgrade something due to some bug or security issue, you have to upgrade all of your application with, uh, with the pure Jakarta E approach. You just upgrade your implementation and leave your API application unchanged. And that I think it's a key, uh, it's a key feature in Java and Jakarta E specifically. Uh, so I think I think that that is basically a key feature of this of this stuff that makes your application really resilient. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that's that's actually um what's what's always driven me towards like things like Jakarta EE, because I, I like standards. Um Mm -hmm. and I don't like I don't like vendor lock-in, even though I spend way too much time working with Amazon and then I think about all the vendor lock-in. Um, <laughs> Um, but I know there's there's abstractions for different things, but um, yeah, and that's always what drew drew me to it, and that's actually why um, on the front end side, that's why I like web components too, because it's the same thing. It's like it's standards in the browser. It's not like you know a new version every ten minutes, like you know. Um, and so I, I've always liked that. Uh, and if you think about it, the things that become standards, uh, the ones that do well, um, that that are not. run by a particular company, they kind of stick around for a long time, which is nice. So Yeah. yeah, Yeah. it seems seems that way. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm curious, um, how how do you find aviation? Like a lot of people who like to, who have a different careers or different interests, there are some similarities between them. Um, so uh, are there any similarities between like, you know, flying an airplane and like writing software? I'm just curious. Ah, uh, I think they're very different. For example, what attracted what attracts me to aviation is that the flights are it's a very compressed timeline, especially for takeoff and landing. But once you're done with the flight, you're done. There's nothing that that there's no more bugs that come out. There's no more. There's no on call. There's no. There's, Right. there's none of that. It's basically you get it done and and then you're done. And at the time, it, it's uh, sometimes it's stressful at the time, but there's no prolonged stress. And I really like that. I mean, cool. I guess you can think of it sort of like like shift work, right? Um, in the sense, I guess it's no. I guess so, maybe. I guess you don't have, I mean, the timeline isn't as defined as, you know, a, like an eight-hour shift or a four-hour shift or whatever, but like. Well, it's very defined. For example, you know, a flight to Phoenix from here takes two and a half hours. So that's basically it. You're that that's it. When, once you're done, you're done. So that's you know, you're, there's no oh, I, I thought of something at three in the morning. Now you gotta go implement it lest I forget, things like that. Right, Because right. yeah, some like that. But it's it's very, you know, the the sun is always shining. And uh, it's the view is the the best of this world. The views are of this world. I just saw uh, a couple of weeks ago. I saw something I've never seen before after doing this for professionally for twenty years. I saw a balloon way above us at like fifty thousand feet, and I asked air traffic control, "What is that?" Because it was small. We didn't know what that was, and sure enough, they're like, "Oh, that's a weather balloon." 
Okay. I've never seen I've never seen it before. It's it was pretty awesome. Yeah. Stuff. I think most uh, UFO calls are uh, usually that, but I guess uh, more of the uh, satellites have been uh, been most of the calls now. That oh my gosh, there's a aliens approaching or no, but it's I, I know there's a difference between UFO and aliens. But I remember <laughs> what, uh, weather balloons always used to be at, uh, in the early days. We know aliens are already on Earth because we have C++ guys. Come on. They, who else could have written that? <laughs> right. I have a question for, uh, for, for Lenny while, I, while I've got my foot in the door here. I, and uh, you know, I've, since we're comparing your other interests to programming, tell us a little, a little bit about your violin playing career and how does that relate to programming? Oh, I, I yeah, didn't I, yeah, I was playing violin since I was three years old. Oh, nice. And I kind of got sick of it at about... 14 or so uh i had a i had a lot of talent for the violin and i skated on it basically uh for 10 years when i was a kid and then they you know the people who actually had not only the talent but only the, the stamina to practice eight hours a day and i couldn't keep up with that and i never wanted to do that but i did play in carnegie hall once that's amazing nice yeah, As nice. part of a group, there was a group uh, like the the child prodigy exhibition thing. So it was me and a couple of other kids that played in Carnegie Hall, nice. and uh, wow. that was kind of, kind nice. of cool my violin career. That's pretty cool. I I imagine it was classical music that you used to play, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, it was the Milton Concerto I played. Nice. At Carnegie Hall. And so, how how do you how does playing music relate to programming for you? Do you engage the same part of your brain? Is it like a flow state, a similar kind of a flow state going on for music and programming? Or do you compose code like you would maybe compose music? Like how do you, do you see parallels between music and programming? Uh, between music and, pro both, music has parallels with both programming and flying. It just, I don't know, you get the same kind of pleasure when you are, when you get something good at it. When you're playing and it just works for you, it's the same as, you know, your flight is going very smoothly and everything kind of works out as planned uh, or the same as, you know, in development, it's it's the same when, you know, you write some program or you refactor something and then it just works the first time or even the second time and nothing uh, comes out, you know, no, no, no side effects come out. It just... You're just fantastic. Oh, by the way, I have a spicy take on flow state. I hate flow state. Flow state is terrible because that's how you lose days and days of time <laughs> without without realizing it. And your family are is mad at you because you're not paying attention to them. Hmm. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. I, I, I worry about my son doing that because like he'll we'll be eating dinner and he'll be like, I have an idea. And he'll run up and do something with Legos. And it's like, dude, write it down. <laughs> Come back to dinner. <laughs> like, like I can totally see what's going to happen yeah, to you. Come back yeah. to dinner. Yeah. In about 10 years, exactly. I can see. Come back to dinner. Oh. <laughs> um, I had another question for you. Um, so I, I was when I was reading your bio, you said you started um you started working at a at a bank. It was like when you're like 18 or 19 or something. Yeah, it it was actually probably 17 maybe 16 i lied about my age i, I said i was 18 ah and i looked like i was 15. i looked like i was 15 <laughs> <laughs> and it's legal to work when you're 16 it's 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 not like i broke any laws or anything <laughs> so uh, but you know i started putting them on my resume or somewhere telling everybody that i was 18 and that was it but how, I mean, you had done, you had done some work before then, or you just basically came in and said, Hey, I'm, I'm 18. I'm awesome. I wrote some apps, some programs here, there, here's what I wrote or, or what, how did that work? Uh, well, pretty much if my, my first job before wall street, I did, I did a couple of, uh, consulting things. You know, I was spending hours and hours on the computers before even I did even that. And I learned a few things and, you know, they, they I got some very junior position and, I got better for a year there, for a year there. And when I came into Wall Street at 17, I already had some experience behind me. And uh, yeah, I got a, like a junior developer position there. And, you know, it was, it was fun. Nice. Yeah, that, that's really cool. Like, I, I think, uh, 
at 17, I was still goofing off and uh, actually I wasn't really goofing off, but, but I was still in high school. <laughs> so. Well, I, I, I had no choice. I had no choice. My parents really didn't make, uh, didn't make any money and I had to contribute to the family somehow. And I, I, I had no choice. I, I could not goof off. Hmm. Well, I, I think that's an awesome story. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, to, especially to end up working on, on interesting things, I think, getting your foot in the door to do work is one thing, but getting to foot and your foot in the door to do like actually wall street work is that, that that's like interesting work. That's fun stuff. So. And I gotta, I, I, I gotta take, make a shout out to uh, the person who, uh, who made it all happen. His name is uh, Mark Appel and he's awesome. And he's the one who gave me my shot at wall street. And nice. uh, he, he says he doesn't regret it. So, you know, we're, we're, we're still <laughs> friends. We hang out. Every time I'm in New York, pretty much, and uh, we we have a good time. That's nice. awesome. Hey, uh, real quick, I just wanted to thank you for all your contributions to, uh, especially to Jakarta EE and yeah. that ecosystem, because I know that uh, every one of us who is using Jakarta EE and Prime Faces and whatnot, we're all using something that you've probably touched. So we appreciate that. Uh, I see that you know you've got lots of open source contributions. I have two questions. Uh, what's your favorite uh, contribution mm -hmm. uh, or what's your favorite project you've contributed to? And also, second question is, I see Archillion is on here. And are you doing things with respect to uh, helping Archillion to work better with Jakarta EE? Okay, so my... Uh... Focal point, I guess. I had I have two focal points in the last few years. One of them is security, and the other one is software testing. And I think software testing is a bane of a lot of people' ex existence. And the easier it is, the better the situation is for the software sure. that you're developing. For example, one of the libraries, which is my one of uh, one of today's picks for me, I got ninety nine percent coverage, but not like stupid coverage, real coverage, like uh, realistic, realistic coverage where if it breaks, it actually breaks, and you know you're not testing getters and setters, and you're not testing addition whether that works or anything like that. So a lot of people uh, oh, uh, say that our oh, Achillean is stupid and uh, test containers are much better. But the truth is you would use our Achillean with test containers or without test containers, but you would still use our Achillean uh, because it's just super, when you use it correctly, it is super simple. And it's simpler than really than anything that I've seen so far. So I really like Herculean and uh, I just contributed, I just fixed bugs, just, just simple stuff. I just fixed bugs and improved uh, things that make it a lot easier to use. Nice. And especially the UI testing is also a something that nobody or very few people do. And with Herculean drone and graphene, it's super easy. Just a couple of annotations here and there. Just pick a field and just press a button. Super simple code, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just it's just amazing how easy it is to do UI testing and any kind of Jakarta EE testing with Archelian and Drone and Graphene. Those three things, and when you combine them all, even like with containers, if you got a dot image, you just are repo for github or whatever it is you're using go uh-oh yeah i don't know if it was me or if it was lenny dude you killed him <laughs> oh. lenny's frozen <laughs> oh no <laughs> well i think he, he touched on a really important topic there testing yeah. and how developers uh, you know relate to testing I think that that would be a great discussion point. If we can, if he comes back, we should uh, hopefully yeah. we can ask him some more questions about that. Uh, have you guys worked with Archillion before? Have you guys used that? Long yeah, like time it. ago, back when I was like a, a JBoss nutcase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, JBoss scene, we used to do uh, Archillion. Oh, yeah. That was pretty cool. No, like it, it would execute your tasks in the container, like in in process, basically. 
with the rest of the the code running in the server. So it was yeah. pretty interesting. It was pretty fantastic cool. framework. And I remember looking at like the I see I wanted to talk about the journey graphene stuff because you know when I look at front end testing these days, like what we've done recently is like test containers and Selenium or we could have used um God, what is the actually I think you had it in your notes, didn't you? Cypress. Yeah, Cypress is the new one. And there's Cypress other... and uh, Playwright and a few of yes. the others. Hmm. So I thought about using those, but at the time we had a mostly Java team and I was like, it'd be easier to just use Selenium. Um, right, right, right. But, um, but yeah, so using that with test containers is pretty much what I've seen lately. Um, but if I remember correctly with Arkillian, you could do, you could do like UI tests and then also test the backend in the same test. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Right. They would uh, get in, in both layers there in the front end and in the back end. And yeah, see, that's kind of cool. cool. Definitely. We, uh, yeah, definitely. It's an interesting approach uh, to, to, to UI testing. I mean, there's so many different testing frameworks now and, and it, that's a good thing, right? Like mm -hmm. I don't know why, why developers don't love testing. That's something I just, again, I'm struggling with too. Um, but you know, as someone who they just loves don't want to put time on it. Mm -hmm. Time. Well, do you like, do you like to refactor your code? And do you yeah. like production? Do you like stability in production? That's right. Like yeah. Those two things. No, you're preaching the choir, but yeah, yeah absolutely right. By, by virtue of liking those two things, you must love testing then, right? Like otherwise, you, you you're there's a, you know something fundamental missing in your approach to software development, right? Sure. But, I think no, sometimes like, though the problem also number one there's there's a discipline, right? Like I work with teams where they just don't like some people write tests, some people don't, but there's no like organizational structure that encourages it. Um, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's, it's hard to develop that, that, that culture and that structure as well. Yeah. Like it's not like, yeah. you know, it's not like we're, I mean, I remember learning like a little bit about unit testing and when I was studying Java, but it wasn't like a core, you know, subject like networking or file IO or database program or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's just like a, Good point. kind of a footnote on your journey to learning Java, like logging, you know, it's like you learn, yeah, there's this thing called log for j Okay, great. Yeah. Use log. Unit testing, J unit. Okay, move on. But it's like to really understand testing, right? Like it's a mindset, right? When you think, you think, oh, I need this feature or I need this functionality in my code. Like immediately, I think the first thing we should think about is how, how the heck do I test that, right? And then right. write the test, write the unit test. That's true. And then, yeah. and then run it and let it fail and then start implementing your, your feature and then watch it pass, right? And then you, you move on to the next feature. So, but to me, like, yeah, that that's like, that's why it's called test-driven development, not development-driven testing, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't write the code first and then, oh yeah, I forgot, I have to write some unit tests. Like, so it's- Because you're only, yeah, you're only yeah. going to test the happy path if you do that, like if you test afterwards. Yeah. And you're, you're not right. going to have that deep brain. I don't, I don't think that's, I, I don't know. I don't think that's sure because I, I, I've i tried writing tests first and I it's, it's just hard for me personally. Um, so I am, depending on the use case, in some cases, it it is easier to write the test first, um, but so a lot of times I'll write the code first, um, but I will still test. I'll think of every possible error path I could think of when, well, when I'm writing tests. So you know? yeah, that, that's and that's normal. a valid point too, Keto. And like Lenny said, right? He, he wrote ninety nine percent useful test coverage, right? So even ninety nine percent, like if you work with a tool like Sonar Cloud, okay, which is I think is a brilliant tool because. They emphasize testing. They like you if you generate test coverage reports for your your during your CI CD pipeline, your build process, your Maven build, you can use Jacoco and generate a J unit or testing G unit, whatever test coverage report. You upload that thing to Sonar Cloud, and it can tell you, okay, you've caught you've covered uh, thirty percent of your new code, new code, not your entire code base. You might have you know fifty thousand lines of code in your in your project, but you only touched. You only wrote five five lines of code, right? Hey, Lenny, welcome back. We we're welcome just back. talking about you opened right. a Pandora's box of discussion topics here with uh, testing. So we jumped into that discussion about test first, test driven development. And it was just finishing a thought here about test. You mentioned ninety nine percent test coverage, okay. right? So Sonar Cloud only emphasizes like eighty percent. Actually, that's by the default um, minimum, but it's for for new code. So if you write a method and it's ten lines of code, and you send a pull request that triggers a build, you're uh, and if you, during that build process, you generate a test coverage report with Jococo or, or LCOV or any one of these tools, whether it's for front end or, back, or Java code or a type of JavaScript frameworks or Java frameworks, you can still generate test coverage, right? You send that report up to a tool like Sonar Cloud, it scans it, it tells you you've got 
10 new lines of code and you've covered 0% or you've covered two out of 10, so 20%, right? So it sets the bar at 80%. So a developer basically should, shouldn't say like, you know what, I hate testing. This is too much work, uh, overhead for me. What to, to write a test that covers eight out of 10 lines of code is asking too much. Like, so th that's, that's where like, to make testing less painful for developers because yeah, nobody wants to stop writing code and to start writing tests. It's almost like you put on a QA hat and you change your role as a developer. You're like, am I really a developer now or am I, am I a tester? So, but really it's the same. Like we should be testing our own code as developers, right? Unit tests. Yeah, integration tests, end-to-end -end tests, functional tests, um, and different kinds of tests like that that happen in the, in the SCLC, right? Software development lifecycle. That, that, that involves other people, other specializations, right? But when it comes down to us writing Java code in our IDEs, why aren't we writing more unit tests? And especially now we have some topics in our list later on to look at some of the great frameworks that are out there today for doing that kind of testing and not just you know unit testing because unit testing has been around for at least what, 10, 15 years. JUnit is not a new framework. Oh, right? Right. So mm -hmm. there are new newer approaches to testing now. There are kind of evolutions of unit testing, right? Of TDD. And that's one of my favorite topics is BDD, behavior driven development. At first, I thought it was like, this is some fad or whatever. I'm not really interested. I love my JUnit and leave me alone. And I'll do my unit test and my <laughs> test for development because I like that. But you know, BDD kind of turned that whole thing upside down for me because it's like your test becomes a, a text file, a specification feature file that defines, you know, in the end users, business user vocabulary, like, um, you know, what is the feature supposed to do? Right. And then uh, you, you have a feature statement, then you have like uh, these steps, like uh, given that I'm on the login screen, when I enter my credentials, then I should be able to log in. For yeah. example, that's a, that's a feature. A feature is user can log in. Scenario one, you know, given that I'm enter, you know, scenario one, enter your credentials and log in. Scenario two, enter invalid credentials and don't log in, you know, things like that. That's where Akito, like you were saying, you test all the variations. So how do you know you've tested positive, negative, success and failure paths, you know, like what, what are the paths? Like, uh, you know, some, someone like a, a, B, a business analyst or a QA person can help write those scenarios in their, in English or in their language. It's there. These tools are localized in many languages. So, you, you know, right. as a specialist, a subject SME subject matter expert can write the specification in the text file and then you, it becomes executable living documentation. Literally mm -hmm. they have implementations of Q, it's called cucumber, right? Cucumber.io. Uh, they have like a ton of uh, different implementations of Cucumber, right? BDD. I uh, recently actually talking about open source projects, became a contributor to, to Cucumber Swift, which is a oh, Cucumber cool. implementation for Swift. So yeah, I'm really excited about that framework. I tried out like half a dozen different Swift because I do a little Swift programming on the side as a hobby. And I was looking for how do I do test driven development BDD with, Q with Swift, right? Because I, that's what I, how I think about things. So I found this tool, I tried a bunch of frameworks and this one was the best. So, um, you know, I'm excited about BDD. So anyway, I'll give it back to yeah. you guys. Yeah, no, just uh, to add to the BDD thing, um, typically it's uh, brought in as uh, uh, the three amigos and the uh, point is that it's not supposed to be like, ooh, we're programming. This is supposed to be write those specifications and talk to your end users or your stakeholders and write that down and then really quiz them on like, what is this software supposed to do? So that way software developers don't go off and start imagining things like, hey, this is what we think that yeah. uh, the end users want. It's it's not, it's what you write down with your meeting with your stakeholders. And you're supposed to get like highly aggressive with like, okay, what, what happens when this happens? And of course they say, oh, that never happens, which of course two weeks later that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but, <laughs> you know, put that down on a specification and then tie that in BDD to TDD TDD feeds back the BDD and, uh, you know, lather, rinse, repeat. And it's, yeah. it's fantastic stuff. There's a I've link been a fan the, for years. That, that's awesome, Dano. Uh, and there's a link in the notes that this is like, I would recommend this link to anyone who's interested in Java and, and, and testing because it's a wonderful, uh, you know, like a series of blog posts that it'll take you at least I think 30 minutes to go through it all and really digest the info. But it's in the it's in the notes that the topic is user stories are not the same as features, right? So yeah. it looks at the evolution of TDD and user stories and how that evolved into BDD and uh, and features. So yeah. and there's it's really interesting because a lot of the agile tools that we use today, like Jira and 
Azure, DevOps, GitHub, uh, um, all these different ecosystems, they use the same, this agile kind of terminology of stories, they have Kanban boards, they have Sprint, and a lot of the agile terminology is based around the idea of a user story. So this is an, kind of, how does BDD and features relate to user stories and, uh, and, ta and TDD, which is kind of the older, like the, the foundation upon which, which it is built. So, uh, but yeah. yeah, it's, it's really interesting and it doesn't have to be overcomplicated and you can actually apply it. Recently we were playing around with test containers and testing, uh, sw swing, uh, sorry, Swift, not sw <laughs> spring boot services with test containers and BDD and Cucumber. And it worked great. Like I mm -hmm. wrote a simple feature file for an API, like, uh, you know, given that the, uh, the client sends, uh, this object to the request, the set sends a request with this payload, then when the, the API receives the request, then it should respond with 200 status code and, and, uh, and another uh, response payload, right? You can kind of document your API specifications as a feature file, and then you can execute that within your, your Spring Boot project yeah. using like rest yeah. assured or using like different tools and run it on a, on a, on a test container or using, maybe you could use uh, Archelion to, to do something like that as well, right? So any, any number of testing frameworks for Java that lets you, you know, execute against your, like a, a real database or uh, a live instance of your application. So, uh, yeah, yeah and, me... and I, I think I, yeah, I, there's two points I want to make. First is that um, we had Seb Rose on his podcast a couple oh, of times. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I was going to say. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so Seb Rose um, is one of the authors of the BDD books, um, and and we talked a lot about Cucumber and about all this stuff. So if anyone's really interested, you should go back in the archives and listen to it at stackedpodcast.com, um, right. where you can also find the show notes. Um, and uh, the other thing is that I I totally agree with you. Um, I was I worked at a place for a couple of years where. That's how we were all of our integration tests essentially was with Cucumber. And we that that time we were using Drop Wizard. Um, but it was still the same idea. And we had we used test containers. We even had uh, test containers. Uh, there's this AWS um library, I forgot what it's called, local stack, um, which which spins up a lot of AWS resources locally um and using mm -hmm. test containers. Um so we did all that kind of kind of stuff. So it's pretty awesome. Nice. Um, nice. The third thing I want to say is that we should probably get back to Lenny. <laughs> Lenny's back, yes. Um, because yeah, sorry, Lenny, like, when you dropped off, we were like my, started like this testing thing, and then we yeah, never my had enthusiasm, to my enthusiasm killed this place's Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> what was funny as soon as Dano came back earlier, uh, you 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 froze. So I I, I I joke that he 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 somehow killed you, but I'm glad you're back. Yeah, it's uh, the, the Wi-Fi went went out and that. Um, here. So Hope we don't have a whole lot of time. time. I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I I just uh, want to know where where we dropped off. It, like, um, at, at what point? You were talking. It's the last thing you talked about was Archelian and drone and graphene. Yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, Archelian one point nine point one is released. Fully supports Jakarta E eleven. Nice. Oh, and, nice. And uh, so fully supports Jakarta E eleven uh, TCK tests as well, and nice. also Drone Alpha eight and Graphene Alpha four released, which supports the latest Selenium, which basically brings it into uh, brings it into the modern times, and runs on the latest Selenium, which is uh, fantastic. That's that's kind of how I do integration testing. Oh, and the discussion that you guys had is fantastic because for me, it's basically the bottom line is this. If the code that you wrote doesn't run in your tests, you might as well delete it because unless it's super simple, you really don't know, unless you run it, you really don't know what it does. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's what I always tell people. It's like you, you need to have some level of confidence that your code actually works it's like and and i say that when i'm working with teams that don't have a lot of testing because if you tell them you have to have 100 percent coverage and everything they'll flip out right so so you have to start small and say hey you need to start writing tests so there's some someone has some confidence that your stuff actually works other than exactly you, you know and guarantee it's either very strong or don't go at all i'm just gonna go yep. ahead go ahead josh <laughs> i'm sorry Go ahead, Josh. Yeah. 
Uh, just that, and that also guarantees things don't break in the future. When you, uh, you. implement something else, it may touch something that you're not expecting and you want to make sure it doesn't break it. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And so, so, but that, I think you answered one of my main questions, Lenny, which is like, those are, because last time I looked at our killing was so long ago, I didn't even know that there was a version that worked with recent frameworks. So Good that's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, it does. It does. And, uh, uh, maybe I'll need to write some more documentation, but the Flow Logics library that I've been working on for a long time just makes it super easy. Has a one static method that just initializes all of the Archelian stuff all in one line. Mm -hmm. uh, that one of the issues with Archelian that it's kind of hard to get the initialization right, and then mm -hmm. if you don't, you get all sorts of weird issues. Yep. But uh, that uh, the, the 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 shrink wrap is the actual library. Uh, if you do that with integration with Maven, it's just one liner and you're done. And uh, I think that is uh, an amazing thing uh, for integration testing, especially with Archelian. And to for some extent, yeah, Graphene hasn't been updated in years until, unless I put in a lot of work myself to get that up to up to date. Graphene and Drone, and they work with the um, they work with the latest stuff along with Archelian now. So it all just works with the latest stuff. And it's uh, real simple now. It's just not complicated at all. Oh, that's, that's awesome. awesome. Lenny, one question for you. So Archelian Cube, I'm reading about this uh, this extension here, and it controls the lifecycle of Docker images as part of the test lifecycle. So is that similar to test containers? Yeah, I don't know much about Archelian Cube. I personally use uh, Archelian with test containers, and okay. that just works brilliantly. Uh, maybe that's the new way, but uh, I don't know. I, I just don't know it a, about Archelian Cube. So, so Lenny, you, you got to update the you got to get someone to update the, the Archelian blog. It uh, doesn't say anything about the new releases. I I know Red Hat is busy getting their their. <laughs> Wildfly or the J Boss stuff up to Jakarta E. Everybody right now in Jakarta E land, everybody's scrambling to get their implementations because the features are frozen, the APIs are frozen, but the implementations in the TCK runs, the um, yeah, these the the all of the vendors are scrambling to get the E eleven stuff out. Gotcha. So mm -hmm. the documentation is kind of not not there quite yet from the right. vendor side. All right, that's awesome. Okay, cool. Another thing about Jakarta E, I just want to get this Jakarta E eleven. I I remember uh, there was a discussion on the Off Heap podcast that lasted about an hour and a half about how uh, you can't use this Jakarta with this version of X and update this and the umbrella jars. What what are those? And uh, I can announce, <laughs> I can just say, forget about all that. Starting with Jakarta E11, there is no, no more umbrella jars. It's just a set of dependencies that are that are transitively imported. And you can exclude and include whatever you want with whatever version you want, as long as your vendor or you can modify all the vendors. You use modularity now, so you can modify the vendor's uh, implementation. So you basically can use E11 as as the, as is, or you can exclude, include, and substitute whatever version you want. So it makes EE11 super, super flexible and not worry about the umbrella jars anymore. Yeah, that's big. Nice, nice. Is there, a, do you know, if there, is there a link about that, Lenny? Do you know? Uh, is there a link about that? Maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure. I guess I could do, ask Google. <laughs> yeah, I, again, it's, it's, it, it, the funny thing is, from the vendor's point of view, it's just amazing how different the vendor's point of view is from the, from the user's point of view. Yep. Vendor's point of view cares about implementation of Jakarta data or new this or new that or or some optimization here, some optimization there. Uh, but from the user point of view, it's just like, how can I use this or how easily can I use this? And uh, a lot of vendors put that on the back burner. So... Uh, there's uh, again, they're trying to get the the e eleven wrapped up, so the documentation and the blogs are probably coming later yeah, coming. rather than earlier. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I have a question for you guys about Jakarta EE versus the old Java EE days when we had like uh, all the major 
you know, vendors were with JBoss, Red Hat, IBM, WebSphere, and you had uh, BA WebLogic, which later became Oracle WebLogic, and all these big, you know, big containers uh, competing for market uh, dominance. So is that still the same scenario we have today with Jakarta EE, or is it is it transition to much more open source kind of a, a of a product uh, ecosystem, as it were? Um, who wants to answer that question, Lenny? What do you think? I don't know any anything about the in, what the quote unquote industry does. Uh, from what I'm from what I'm understanding is that uh, uh, to be honest, Spring Boot won that war, even though Spring Boot does work on top of Jakarta EE. Uh, so uh, I would say that the 800 pound gorilla is uh, Spring Boot in this space, okay. but again, which kind of means that Jakarta E is also a 800 pound gorilla because Spring Boot is built on top of all the Jakarta E specs anyway. Uh, the rest of the industry, I think both Wildfly, Wildfly is pretty, Wildfly and WebLogic are, thinking, are pretty popular, but I think the industry came away from, you know, we fight for our market share and dominance here. I think it's more of a cooperative lift all the boats type of deal right now, include which includes Spring Boot. So I think it's more of a cooperative approach as okay. opposed to ad adversarial right now. Right. right, right. Yeah, and I, I I would second that. You know, from being involved in, I'm not really involved in like you know the day to day Jakarta E stuff, but I read a lot of the mailing lists and I talk to a lot of people. So. Um, you know, obviously there's still, I mean, there's still competitors to some degree, right? But, you know, it's all open source. It's pretty cooperative. Um, and I think a lot of people have different goals, you know? So, for example, you know, Red Hat has a very different goal with Quarkus than than uh, IBM has with um, than, with, with um, WebSphere Liberty, for example. Um, you know, Halidon on Oracle um, does all the microprofile stuff. Um, and, you know, I think they're really focused on a lot of the Oracle's needs and Oracle's client base and probably a lot of an Oracle internal needs as well. Um, so, so I think there's some overlap, but also, you know, um, the products are pretty different, differentiated at this point, I think. Um, Plus, and I agree with that. Plus, I would like to just add in that nowadays development is a lot different than it used to be lots of uh, back in the day we used to have you know BEA web logic where every everything was deployed onto this big centralized server and that's not really the case anymore um, in most places uh, more likely than not we're running in podman or docker containers and smaller runtimes such as pyra micro or something else uh you know they have open liberty all these open uh source and uh smaller profile servers now and you can basically take your war or jar or whatever you are you creating and just deploy it on one of those and it's pretty open it's not like you're targeting your major server you know your corporate right. server mm -hmm. anymore it's not like that yeah, I think the cloud must have changed the landscape dramatically too, right? I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's pretty pretty much every every server has the ability to generate like a small executable runtime at this yeah. point. So, um, yeah, uh, it's an interesting interesting world. And actually, what I what I'm I'd like to see, I think there's been some cooperation um, between Spring and um, Jakarta EE for like the new Jakarta data spec, if I remember correctly. Um, Absolutely. The Jakarta data is awesome. And uh, well, J Jakarta Jakarta data is uh, kind of the standardization of what Spring already has with Spring data. Exactly. And they have co-op, especially the Hibernate folks, Gavin King and his team, uh, from uh, from Hibernate has been very cooperative in that uh, in that regard. So that that stuff is converging pretty well, and uh, yeah, that's that's one of the exciting new features of Jakarta E11. That's very true. Yep. And uh, Jakarta E11 is 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 it actually finished now? The like... APIs and the specs are all finished. Okay, it's just fine. that we're waiting for the TCK and implementations and the vendors to get to get their last remaining pieces. Okay. Okay, that's cool. 
So we can expect this sometime this fall, sounds like. Uh, yeah. Cool. Hey, those tests are being written after the fact, right? I'm just joking. <laughs> 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 oh, Isn't nice. that interesting though? TCKs, that's a good example of test driven development, test driven architecture, right? Where you, you know you have to run your implementation through a, a test bed anyway, right? So that, that's a good example of how I think in you know, a way Java has maintained some stability in, in, in the For industry. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yep. definitely, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, Lenny, I know you are almost out of time. Um, is there any other topics you want to jump to before uh, before you leave? Yeah, I got uh, I got a couple of topics. I'd like to talk about Apache Shiro, which I am uh, one of the main contributors to now, and on the uh, on the management on the steering committee, which is uh, pretty awesome. Uh, steering committee of Apache. That's 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 not too bad. It's yeah. a security framework that's compatible with Jakarta EE and Spring Boot. And the key differentiator on that, there's a couple of things. One is you configure everything with one file. Jakarta security, it's kind of, it works, but you got to configure it all over the place. But this one, it's just configure it in one file. And uh, it also does something that no other security framework does. It integrates with Jakarta faces to resubmit a form in case you're logged out. For example, have you ever like just entered a whole bunch of stuff in the form and then went out to lunch and uh, came back and filled the rest of it out and hit submit and everything is gone? Yeah. But with Apache Shiro, that does not happen. It will remember your uh, all of your form data and resubmit it once you hit submit, even if you're logged out. Oh, nice. That's cool. So that's one feature and works out of the box with Prime Faces and Jakarta Faces. And the other, the other feature is the wildcard permissioning scheme, which I think is uh, one of the few in the industry that that's implements that. Uh, basically, you, your permissions are going to be like file colon star colon read or file colon uh, user, you know, user process one colon read or something like that. So you can basically configure your security the way you want. And uh, using wildcards, you could just customize your your security access however you want. So that's Apache Shiro. It's compatible with Jakarta E10 and Jakarta E11. And uh, if you're looking for a Java security framework, that's I think that's that's the one. And it also integrates with Jakarta security, so you can use your favorite uh, roles allowed and annotation and things like that. Yeah, nice. and it also integrates with like LDAP and. Uh... JDBC, Active Directory, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. It's got it's got realms. It's got pa like the newest algorithms for, for password uh, encryption, so you don't have to worry about getting hacked and all that stuff. Cool. Nice. And I have a pick. You want to talk about uh, my pick? Yeah. Uh, my pick is the Flow Logics library. That's the one that I've been working on for a long, long time, and it's got a whole bunch of stuff including uh, a simpler a JPA integration of prime faces, which I think is, uh, I, I refactored it like five or six different times as both prime faces and JPA approved. And it's, it's injectable, it's integrated fully with CDI, so you can just inject it. And you have basically your screen is uh, infinite infinite scroll database table. You can just implement it in two lines of code. Nice. Uh, also includes that one liner Archelia initialization, and uh, a few things like uh, automatically uh, gets your compressed JavaScript code as opposed to uncompressed, depending on whether your Jakarta Faces is in production mode or in development mode. It sets up a whole bunch of stuff for prime faces, uh, so you don't have to do anything in your web XML file. So your web web XML can be empty, and it just uh, the theme is fantastic quick start. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I just finished a Maven archetype that uh, I have to document a lot of that stuff. But the the Maven archetype, so with one liner, you can have a a project that starts that uh, uses all that stuff and your uh, Jakarta EE fully testable with full integration tests that includes uh, Payara by default 
and uh, includes your check style with uh, Google Java, uh, whatever the default Java style guide is, it includes that in there. All the integration tests and all the you know pride faces. If you want to do that, that's you know a single line of dependency. Uh, Archelian, Graphene, Drone, all that stuff is included, and it literally is uh, you know five lines of code. Nice. I've got lots of things to look at. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. That's cool, Lenny. Yeah. And uh, I think the only other thing is, uh, what am I missing uh, from the agenda that we could talk about until the guy, this guy shows up? Let's see. You uh, had something about the WordPress Jamstack dynamic websites. Oh, yes. The web development saga. <laughs> you were asking uh, Keto about this, right? Yes, I was. I was. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So every time... Everybody asks, you know, what do I do? I need a website. What do I do? The quote unquote default answer is WordPress. But every time I hear about WordPress, I hear that your website is getting hacked and all of that stuff. And if you go to WordPress.com, they charge you 30 bucks a month and you mm -hmm. can't get the thing out. And, and it just, uh, everything I hear about it, it just, just turns me off to no, to no end. So my, uh, my quote unquote my way what i want to do is write my website in ascii doc and because of that i can just uh pull any template i want with my ascii doc content and i can take it anywhere i want and uh make a website that way and i think i've had a pretty good success with that i took a template uh, that's bootstrap based and i integrated it with jbake and uh, that way I can basically my website's on GitHub and I can edit it in two seconds. I can add any content, remove any content. And like it, it just, and they can take it, I can remove the template, make another one or whatever it is I want. And I had a good, uh, I had a good experience with that. However, that's a static website. If I want to do a dynamic website, what I probably go for is prime faces. So I guess my question is, uh, there is there is this framework called Tailwind CSS that everybody's talking about, and it seems to be something that replaces Bootstrap. Uh, but I have lots of questions about how to, I guess, if it's integratable with Prime Faces, because maybe Prime Faces had its own templating engine. Uh, uh, so you know it's what? kind of like a lot of technology that that how does it fit all all of it fits together is I guess. That's my next question in my website development journey. I yeah. think um, I've actually talked to Chatai recently from from uh, Prime Tech about this, and they're actually because Tailwind is so popular. Um, they right now Prime View is sort of their sort of the the uh, the first project they work on, and then they port everything else to other other platforms. Mm -hmm. So all the all the theming that they're doing for Prime View. Um, is actually uh, based on top of like Tailwind. So and th they had their own, I think it was Prime, was it Prime Flex, I think, um, did a lot of that sort of Tailwind sort of stuff. Um, and now he's gonna use Tailwind on top of it. They have an unstyled version um, that you can use for Prime View and I think Prime NG now. Um, and I think what's gonna happen is whenever the new theming stuff that Shatai worked on personally for a long time, Mm -hmm. Whenever it gets its way to prime faces, it'll integrate with Tailwind like out of the box. That's my understanding. Oh, oh that's if that's actually true, I cannot wait for that because I think if that's if that's the case, I could just not worry about you know uh, static site generators or any of that. Just use prime faces for everything, and I cannot wait till that moment. I think that will solve anybody who works with Jakarta EE and Java and doesn't uh, want to touch JavaScript to any kind of extent, more extent than necessary. Uh, I think that's a godsend for for people like that. Yeah, and what I'll do is, oh, I think I found it. I found the video, yeah, I'll put, whoops. Sorry. <laughs> I will put this in the show notes at uh, stackedpodcast.com and uh, you, you'll have, uh, 
that way you can see the video because uh chat i put out a video a couple months ago about it so okay. at least the prime view version i don't know when it's going to be in prime phase if that's going to be your question <laughs> so yeah well, Prime NG is, uh, is also moving in that direction, as you mentioned, Keto. And, and Lenny, just like for your, for just for some background as well, I used to work exclusively in JSF and wrote a couple of books on, in fact, one on Prime Faces as well. And I wrote, I tried to bridge this gap, right, between the developer UI and, and the back, back end or a Java developer and a web developer kind of mindset with the uh, building custom plugins for Adobe Dreamweaver that would support Java and actually bootstrapped a whole Java virtual machine behind Dreamweaver so you can run your JSF code like basically in Dreamweaver. Oh, no way. Yeah, I kind of, you know, That's for many meant, yeah. reasons, put it on hold, put it on, you know, put it on the back burner, but it, it was hard to maintain. There's a lot of, you know, moving parts, supporting Mac and Windows and supporting Dreamweaver itself, which was evolving quickly. And when, you know, Macromedia sold it to Adobe and then it, they changed a lot of, of the architecture of the product. But I had to write a lot of C++ code as well to, to deal with Java native interface and do all that stuff, memory management with Boost library and all these other C++ kind of tools. But um, yeah, the long story short is uh, like, you know, I kind of moved away from JSF as a UI framework and moved more toward, I realized like, well, yeah, you can try to bridge that gap and hopefully some, you know, Java developers get gain skills in web development and learn about like, yeah, I mean, JavaScript is this, like, you know, you call, call it earlier 800-pound gorilla in the room. It's like, you can't ignore it, right? Like, it's that's the language of the browser. It's the lingua franca, mm -hmm. frank, franca of all the browsers, right? Like, for your Firefox, Chrome, Edge, all these browsers only speak JavaScript, right? And yeah, you can, there's exceptions, but primarily that's the language of the, the scripting language of the web. And there's no way, real way to avoid that. But you can, you know, you can abstract it with things like TypeScript, you know, and other languages that transpile down to JavaScript. But, and JavaScript itself, ECMAScript is evolving and the standards are getting better and better. And it's becoming looking a lot more like a proper full featured object oriented programming language. And it's, there's a lot of benefits to using JavaScript too from like, think of how long it takes to run a unit test in Java versus, you know, in JavaScript, it's a, an order of magnitude faster. I'm sorry to say, but it is because you don't have to bootstrap any JVM. You just executing like, uh, you know, for example, Jest, or VTest, one of these frameworks that it runs your code natively in, in Node.js. So the runtime is just orders of magnitude faster. I'm sorry to say, I, although, I mean, look, there were competitions on like data processing and like the million row competition. Java was, you know, in, in like, I don't remember how many seconds they're able to process, you know, millions of rows of data. So I'm not saying Java is not fast, can't do performance related coding, but uh, just from an everyday developer, web development perspective, you know, unit testing and so on, I think JavaScript has some advantages too. But um, long story short is, yeah, like Tailwind, and especially, especially what the Prime team is doing, uh, I think is great work because all these, uh, a lot of web developers and uh, front-end developers want to use Tailwind because it's this gorgeous CSS framework. It's very intuitive and semantic, uh, like... Um, I remember Keto you know, years back when you know Jacob Hookum was working on facelets before it became part of JSF2. Uh, there was a lot of talk about semantic contracts, and that was one of the the, the glue between the HTML and the and the CSS layer that the Java developers and the, uh, the 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 front end developers would have to kind of agree on how to how to name things so that JSF component authors could emit semantically correct HTML for for a CSS uh, coder to to style properly. So. Tailwind solved that problem basically, right? They they've introduced their own, you know, native semantic uh, contract for for CSS that's intuitive, extensible, and it's it's almost like a, a a mathematical language. You can you can define grids and you can define like um, padding and all these things with like just numeric suffixes on your on your selector names. It just makes a lot of sense. It's very intuitive and it's it's very beautiful too like it's it's a it produces nice looking pages and css so going headless is definitely the right way if if uh you know flow logics like you said if that, that's supporting prime faces and and i think that's great too like if we can if the jsf community can also benefit from you know that same approach int introducing tailwind you know i think that's a great thing um, in my personal journey, I've moved away from JSF. I've, I, Java for me now is purely, you know, API backend database programming language. I don't, I mean, yeah, cloud, uh, you know, networking, fine, uh, database programming, fine, uh, file system, all this stuff is, is great, but I don't do UI 
programming the job anymore. But um, you know, not to say I didn't, not to say I don't respect it. Um, like you know, uh, Swing, for example, I remember one contract I had was just writing a Swing desktop app for for an enterprise uh, organization. It was great. It was great fun doing UI with Java. So um, no, not to say it's it's still it's still very relevant today. I'm sure it's a huge uh, market share for. For, for the web developers and the UI program. I, I, I don't know if I quite say that. Um, <laughs> well, Significant. I, mean, I mean, the reality is, and, and this is, you know, uh, someone who's also done, and we still do JSF work when we have a client that needs it. Um, but uh, no, I mean, it's 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 an old technology. It's just not that popular to write server-side web applications. Although I know a lot of the front-end uh, frameworks are starting to have server-side rendering and stuff. So it's sort of blurring that Very um, yeah, and let's talk about let's talk about HTMX. I don't know if any of you use HTMX. HTMX is basically a uh, uh, language agnostic version of, of 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 Faces. Anyway, so I mean, it seems to be popular. So the way, I mean, I I don't know if I buy that everything should go JavaScript because just because as an example, HTMX is is basically popular and as you said as as you said keto uh javascript people are starting to discover um the server side rendering which is basically we're going back to faces anyway and uh from the user perspective i gotta say this uh i could see the sites going to react more and more websites are going to react and i can tell because they're very slow I can say that if I go to my banking website now versus about a year or two ago, it would have it would it would pull up the page and then I could see those gray rectangles and they and they're like flowing and flowing and flowing for about five, 10 seconds, and then one pops up, it hydrates, and then the other one does, and the other one does, and they have to wait like 20 seconds for the page to render, and then they have to, have to click, and then the same thing happens. Page comes up right away, but it's all these gray rectangles, and they have to wait yeah, for those but, to rehydrate. I mean, I, it, I, I would say that's more of an implementation issue, um, although I, that is partially why I like web components, because they actually run really fast in the browser, because it's actually native code running in the browser. Um, but, you know, you, you can make anything bloated. I've I've worked on lots of really slow JSF apps too. So. Oh no, no, I I I agree. But what yeah. I see, like with my own eyes, as people migrate their websites from whatever they had before to wow. React, I think they're becoming slower and slower and slower. Uh, uh, and it, yeah, you know, that's a great point because look at, at who's writing the code now, right? You're taking like you someone like yourself, a C plus plus Java programmer. This group on this on this podcast are all Java coders. You guys have the years of training, discipline, and experience in object-oriented programming and having managed dependencies and working in like a complex compiled statically typed language environment, right? Now you you give like you give the the give the task to someone who's coming from like a HTML, JavaScript, CSS background. They don't have the depth of experience to say, like, I know how to write my tests, I know how to refactor my code, I know what a class hierarchy is, I know what an interface and an implementation is, I know. A solid principle, like you, the the standard, the bar is a little bit lower, right? So, like the challenge is for those developers to 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 upskill and become better better coders, right? But the, yes, the performance issues is usually, I think, a symptom of lack of experience, lack of discipline in in programming. But that's that's a solve that problem can be solved through through coaching, through experience, through training, right? But I, I think having had the experience of writing UI on the server and on the client. I think, think about it this way. And, and Ted Neuert, as much as I disagreed with him about his our, his point about the Vietnam War, the, uh, Hibernate is being like object relational mapping is the Vietnam War of the Java industry. So I'm paraphrasing loosely because we had an interesting, he, he had a, a controversial blog post about that years back. But anyway, I, and I've talked to him about it in person once at a conference, kind of disagreed with him on it. But one thing he did mention to, to me that and where he wrote that was very relevant, I think, to this discussion is that you want to keep processors close to data, as close as possible to the data, right? So think about it this way. Server-side rendering, right? Server-side templating, you generate all this HTML, CSS, JavaScript, you push it out to some uh, edge device, basically. You're sending it off to some browser across, halfway across the internet, right? And it's running there. So why why is all the logic on the server? Why isn't the logic on the client? 
Think about that, right? So that's what front end development does today is it takes advantage of all that, that all the resources on the end user's desktop machine or mobile device, which are increasingly sophisticated, powerful devices with plenty of RAM, very fast CPUs and modern browsers. And you can, you know, you can crunch data, you can render things in a sophisticated way. You, you can, you have asynchronous networking going on. There's, there's a lot of capabilities. So you have, persistence, you can use local storage, you have um, uh, different uh, different cookies, obviously. But so my point is, um, yeah, there's trade-offs, right? But server-side templating has advantages too. I, I'm not discrediting. So di different architectures. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about my personal experience. And uh, if you think about it, uh, what really happens is you download a whole bunch of JavaScript code and HTML to render your initial page. And then your JavaScript runs and it goes, calls an API, comes back, calls an API, comes back, calls an API, comes back. That comes with latency. And I think that's what I'm seeing with the, with all that React code. Yes. The, the issue there is, so yeah, the issue there is that Ajax style, you know, programming, which is the, I would say the early stages of asynchronous JavaScript was like that, as you described, every click is an, is a server side uh, request, right? Every interaction triggers some, some asynchronous request back to the server. But modern single page applications running on React and Angular, for example, what they tend to do, I think now is you, you make fewer API calls, you hold that data and you just manage it in, in the browser using tools like Redux or other state management patterns, which are, it's like an extension of MVC but that, that has a, like basically an in-memory database that you can now, you can manage. You can manage that data, you can store it, query it, mutate it. Uh, and um, if you think about it, the applications that run in the browser now, I think are, in my experience, as or more sophisticated than any Java application I ever worked on. It's, it's getting, like, think about it. What, what, what is the complexity on the server side? I mean, you have these beautiful, mature, stable, powerful APIs that do all the work for you. Where's the complexity? Now you, you push that complexity out to the browser and you ask an inexperienced developer to, to make a functional application. And th that's where some of the challenges are today. So I, I agree, there's a lot of truth to what you're saying. I, I think we do have challenges today and the performance is one of them. Um, and bad design is another over too much networking, latency, all these, these problems are very real for sure. Yeah, um, and uh, obviously, uh, all I'm saying is this is what I see with my own eyes, and what you're saying is completely valid. But uh, the the reality is right now that the website performance with the new, with the at least the React apps that I've seen is is atrocious in my in my opinion. That's unfortunate. It, it's a symptom of, like I said, a lack of experience and skill. I think or training, perhaps. But you, you make some good points. And you know, it's, it's what I love the most about JSF was the component driven nature of JSF. You write the, these components of component vendors, libraries of components it's going all the way back to like the, the visual basic days where you could drag and drop some widget onto a canvas and you have a functional app. That was the, that was the promise of component based UI development, right? And, and that still exists today with, with tools like, uh, like, for example, Angular is very much component driven. And that's why PrimeNG exists. That's why PrimeView exists, Prime React exists. All these communities need components to build their applications, UI components. Nobody wants to write a date picker six times, you know, over six projects. Like you, you give me a date picker, I can drop into my application and just let the user select a date. Please. Oh, and, don't start with don't start with me and date pickers. Every date picker <laughs> I've seen on any website I've used is absolutely horrible. Yeah, and no, I filed no. some bugs in price Just give me a text field, right? <laughs> Yes, um, I just want to pivot a bit. Um, uh, so, uh, Lenny, you brought up HTMX. Um, yes, and HTMX I found intriguing because I I keep, I keep on seeing people people keep on telling me about it, and actually, uh, Daniel Michael Carducci likes it a lot as well. Um, He's writing a book um, on software architecture, and I suspect HTMX might be in there somewhere. No, I'm um, sure it is, yeah. Uh, so I, I'm just going to uh, share my screen for those of you who are actually um, seeing this. Uh, so uh, if you were to accurately summarize, and I, I have not used HTMX. I just know a lot of people keep on talking about it. Um, but basically, it is it does remind us a little bit of, of JSF, but it's a client-side library. Um, doesn't do anything with on the back end, but basically you make 
you you use straight HTML and use special tags that it, that the browser ignores and the little little uh, JavaScript library understands, and it can do stuff like submit a request to a server and get a response back and then do stuff with the attributes that it gets back and things like that. Well, it it it, it submits a request and then it gets back HTML, which right. is exactly what Jakarta Faces does. Uh, for it's it's basically the, the way I see it. There's couple uh, there's two different types of websites. There is high interactivity, which is like drawing on a canvas, something that you can only do with JavaScript. And there is these low interactivity websites, which are basically your banking websites, your, you know, something that displays data, uh, even like in infinite scroll table, even Facebook, like uh, for example, if you do Facebook or LinkedIn, these websites are not high interactivity because it's kind of, the components, it's basically they pop in, they pop out, but you don't really uh, manipulate the components. Uh, so I, I think for low interactivity websites like that, something like Jakarta Faces or HTMX for that matter, I think are a better fit than, for example, React, which are, React, you can dynamically generate components and do uh, lots of things, but these regular business websites, they don't really... They don't really take advantage of that, and I think the server-side rendering, uh, if, if done in, you know, if you're a JavaScript developer, you can do that in React or Express or whatever the, the J, JavaScript framework du jour is. But if you're a Java programmer, if you know Java, uh, using Jakarta Faces, I think is a better fit because for things that you don't need huge interactivity, uh, you can just use use Jakarta faces and uh, your and prime faces and I think that's just going to uh, do uh, going to work better for you yeah the, you may have hit the like the keyword there is low, low interactivity website and the, the other challenge yeah. too it's, it goes in both ways right it's hard for a Java developer to transition into pure you know JavaScript CSS kind of coding mindset and vice versa it's hard for a JavaScript developer to transition into a Java mindset and adopt True. like a Java-based framework. So it's probably much harder for a, a JavaScript developer to learn Java than it is for a Java developer to learn JavaScript, to be to be fair, right? Yeah, I think I mean, so. Once you learn how to write code in Java, like the it's really trivial to go to JavaScript. But the yeah, the, it's dynamic. I don't, I, I don't know if I buy I don't know if I buy that that statement because I've tried <laughs> learning JavaScript many times and the basic stuff I can do, but the more complicated stuff, it it's just sure. I, I'm not understand I'm not getting that the more complicated stuff. So it, that's where you know thanks thankfully Keto introduced me to TypeScript a few years ago and I haven't looked back. Like I rarely do JavaScript coding in in and of itself. Like I'll you know use TypeScript. And TypeScript looks a lot like Java, except it has fewer fewer keywords, right? You have no final keyword. You have like a lot of uh, features are missing. Language features are missing, but it's it's evolved over the years. It's caught up. They didn't have abstract classes for a while, and now they do. They have the abstract keyword, and it, it's really interesting. Is the the TypeScript compiler is translating or transpiling is the term your yeah. TypeScript code into JavaScript. So if you look at the transpiled code, it's like, oh wow, okay, I see how they're you know, achieving this like uh, inheritance, for example, how do I have a subclass in JavaScript doesn't natively support inheritance. So they, they find ways to, you know, generate this, the code that, that works that way for you semantically, even though you never write that code, I would, I wouldn't, I would never want to write that the transpile yeah, version of JavaScript. It's pretty bad. Yeah. yeah, but but then you're getting into the transpilers and the bundlers and uh, I What's heard the that. Java bytecode, you know, Java, Java C is a compiler, right? Yeah. It's Do you just, ever edit bytecode directly? <laughs> yeah, but but I heard I heard I I don't uh, that that stuff is much slower than the Java C compiles. But again, no, 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 no yes, uh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. It depends on the size of the project. It's like, you know, it 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 all does. But yeah. Uh, yeah, the uh, so I guess uh, the question is how interactive your website is, and I think for business websites, I mean for me personally, as more of a Java guy, I, I would I would not try to do that in JavaScript, especially from what I see in my own in my own eyes. But again, uh, Ian, you have uh, obviously uh, all your points that you've made are are very valid, very very valid. 
and uh, no I'm kind of a me, script, I, JavaScript Luddite, I guess. <laughs> no, no. I mean, <laughs> there's, you know, I love the idea of having all your technology in one, under, under one uh, umbrella, right? So having the UI, the API, the, like all the, 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 all the technology basically written in one language, your whole technology stack written in Java. It was, it was a great idea. And it makes sense in a lot of cases still to do that. I mean, if, especially if the team's co core competency is Java, they don't uh, like, you know, it's great to be able to drop a, you know, a jar into your, your web app, your prime ng, prime faces added to your Maven, uh, you know, manifest. And now all this HTML is being written for you, right? So you get all this like a free code as it were, right? That's, that was the benefit of, of the JSF component ecosystem is you get all these yes. great components, data tables, infinite scrolling, like you mentioned, a lot of cool stuff. And you can actually build like fairly dynamic, very dynamic, very interactive application that there's no reason why they have to be slower than something written natively yeah. in JavaScript. So it's just a different technology stack, right? Yeah, and and, and you know what I don't like about uh, Jakarta Faces? The only thing I don't, the, the, the one thing I don't like is XHTML. That's the that's the leftover from the olden days. That, it was it was a logical bet at the time, but it yeah, did not work out well. Because for those who don't know the history of it, uh, uh, because of course I I now have this uh, history of uh, web development talk, so <laughs> did some research from fresh my memory about this whole process. Um, but uh, the um there was a period where the W three C was had XHTML and like that was that's what they wanted the next version of HTML to be. And all of the major companies were like, nope, we're not doing it. Um, so they created the, the uh, HTML5 uh, working group. Um, or the, what was it, what, WG? Anyways, it was, it was the web working group, um, mm -hmm. and they did HTML5. Um, and that actually ended up winning. Um, so when, I think when uh, Jacob Hocum picked XHTML for facelets, he thought he was picking the next standard for HTML. It just didn't win you, uh, you know no. there was another reason he i think he picked that as well is for the speed right the 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 parsing yeah component tree generation right he would scan that way the java jsf uh servlet could scan your 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 xhtml files very quickly and build a you know the build that jsf component tree in memory quickly but yeah it's a uh, to your point keto i mean html5 and what came before html4 right i remember when i worked on the uh, JSF for Dreamweaver, we used a library called Tag Soup, and that's that's the the proper oh, term for it, the Tag Soup, <laughs> right? It was trying to clean up this you know wild uh, you know unformatted, inconsistent, self closing tag or or unclosed tag. Wait, you know? is, did that became J Soup later, or is that something else, something different? Uh, I'm not sure. This is a little Java library that parsed the uh, you know HTML sure. in the wild and tried to turn convert it to XML. Yeah, cur current. Uh, I I'm using in my projects uh, something called JSoup. Yeah, I see. Ah, that. interesting. I don't know how it's if that's related or not. It does exactly. I think Soup doesn't exist anymore. It was some old library. Mm -hmm. it turned into. Long time back. That's the wrong uh, wrong thing I'm sharing there. My bad. Maybe it evolved from that. I don't know, but it turns into a JSoup. This is what I meant to share. Okay. Uh, the Java HTML parser. Mm -hmm. So I'll, it's jsoup. Nice. I'll put that in the show notes. But, but it's soup. You're absolutely right. It's it's uh, <laughs> yes. HTML is notoriously hard to parse. Yeah. Yes. It's not. I don't envy the browser developers who developers have to build the the Chrome and the Firefox engines that we use every day. It's no, because now they're essentially operating systems, and they are. Yeah. There is a becomes a, a platform basically. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. It is uh, ridiculously complicated. Yeah, um, I think Python's uh, HTML browser parser is soup. Oh, just soup. Ah, and yeah. not pea soup. That would yeah, be I think that's where we get the J soup. <laughs> uh, maybe it's a common theme. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. It definitely makes sense. Um, we should probably move on to another topic um, and wrap up soon. Um, well, my passenger I... didn't show up yet, so I'm, oh, so you're I'm gonna go until my passenger uh, shows up. Okay, all right, nice. Hopefully they appear like right behind you, that'd be kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sitting next to the window so I could see when they drive drive in. Okay, cool, cool. Um, all right, well, let's, let's go back. Um, there's a couple key things I wanted to get to. Um, 
One is that under server-side Java, um, that uh, micro, micro profile 7.0 is out now. Um, this is a new version of the micro profile standard from Eclipse. And uh, the main difference in this, like, is that they're basically sort of dropping micro profile metrics um, and replacing it with micro profile telemetry, which is based on open telemetry, um, which makes total sense because open telemetry is kind of one and sort of the telemetry metri metrics wars. Um, Does any of you guys know how it relates to micrometer? I can't remember. There is a story. But I, I, I remember there's a story too, but I don't just don't know how it relates. Uh yeah, I think no, I'm not sure. Um here we go. We're in, I see I should be asking like some uh oh look, open telemetry. Where does micrometer fit in open telemetry product? Oh look at that. <laughs> uh I thought micrometer I think... was the engine and open telemetry is the specification. Uh, Maybe, because I think Red Hat just with Quarkus, they're like, no more open telemetry. We're using micro, uh, micrometer now, but I don't know if that's, that's they're mutually exclusive or not. I mean, I don't think they are, but I don't, I just don't know. That's the question. But also, aren't they two different things? Because uh, uh, micrometer or uh, uh, micrometer is for exposing things for like uh, Prometheus. Whereas open telemetry is for the telemetry, so you can uh, read like how long a certain method takes or a certain section of your code, which I thought were two different things, but I could be maybe, wrong. maybe. It does say on the micrometer site, it says that micrometer supports publishing metrics to App Optics, Azure Monitor, Netflix, Atlas, blah blah blah, and then eventually it mentions open tele open telemetry. Oh, okay. Signal effects. So my, my, micrometer, micrometer is the engine and open telemetry is the spec, mm -hmm. I think. That sounds good. Thanks. Go with that. that sounds good. <laughs> it's Friday. <laughs> we'll only go so far in this research. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, perhaps we'll have someone on who can uh, clarify things for us <laughs> in the future. Um, but, uh, and I, I think that's the only major change in this release I mean obviously that's a breaking change if you uh, if you're using the micro uh, profile uh, metrics and actually the micro profile metrics is nice it's really simple and easy to use um yep but uh but now so well, now they have seven out it looks like there's a couple of more updated specs in micro profile seven uh the open api 4.0 Oh yes, REST yeah. client four and fault tolerant, tolerance four dot one. So yeah. I wonder what's in those. Also, micro profile the JWT um, off uh, two point one, just a, a minor release on that one. Mm. So yeah, so so um, and the the old micro, micro profile metric specs still exists. Um, it just uh, they're probably not going to rev it anymore. I'm guessing, um, but it's it's not part of the umbrella micro profile specs. Mm. It's, it's not a core spec. Um, I should mention in related news, um, I started bugging the uh, mac macro profile GraphQL people about like, hey, when's your next release coming out? Um, <laughs> and so I think I somehow got myself roped into maybe being the spec lead for the next release. Mm. Oh, <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> because because they're, they're like, especially, especially Philip Kruger is one of the main um, developers on the first version of the micro profile GraphQL. Mm. And um, another person from Red Hat, Jan, um, they're, they're like, you know, we can help you, but we can't drive it, you know. Um, so I've been trying to get some people together. So if anyone's interested in that, you can uh, ping me at keto9.mastodon.social. Um, <laughs> and because uh, I, I think we could definitely use some help. But um, but I, uh, the main thing missing in the micro profile GraphQL spec is GraphQL subscriptions, which I really like to add. So mm. um, uh, all right, so that's one topic. Um, does anyone else have anything they really want to discuss? I, I have one or two more well, things. Since our last podcast, CentOS 7 went EOL. I don't know if anyone is running any. I any did. I Linux heard about containers. that. Yeah, that's a big but, one. Uh, yeah, if you're if you're running containers on Linux and you, you you're using like a Linux base image, not some not some libraries base image, uh, then you probably were using 
well, like me, if you're like me, you were using, if you were using CentOS 7, you, you discovered the hard way after June 30th that your images are no longer building because the Yum repo, RPM repos are down and you can't even rebuild old, old images uh, oh without using anything. So completely, completely like end of the road. So this is kind of a shock for, you know, Linux and the open source community. If you're relying on this, this uh, distribution for any kind of production workloads and now you're kind of SOL. So yeah, I guess people are pivoting to obviously Red Hat wants people to pivot to Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, there was, there's a couple other implementations. I ended up on Alma Linux. So I just wanted to share that, really? that was my picks. Yeah, That's, because uh, not, Alma is from the Spanish word for soul. So they're trying to stick to that. This, the, the spirit of the original like uh, free Linux uh, movement and it's it's a pretty decent, it's binary compatible with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Uh, there's no YUM command, it uses DNF uh, instead, but it's basically the same thing. So for package management, it's pretty pretty much the same. And yeah, and it, it works and it's supposed to be a forever free Linux. So if you made the mistake of, you know, on, onboarding with CentOS years back, although it's questionable if that's a mistake, if you got years and years of stable- It's a logical thing to do. Linux run time. Yeah. And I've been using Oracle Linux, and it's been working just great. Really nice. It, and I've been using Oracle Linux and on my own VMs, and I've been using Oracle Linux on their uh, cloud offering, which you can uh, you can get uh, a four CPUs uh, gobs of memory for free forever. So I've been doing that, and it's been working out great. You know, I should try that. I always forget that they have a cloud offering, and then. Something like that reminds me, and I'm like, I should try it out. Yeah. Okay, guys, yeah. I got to go. My passenger is here. All right. Well, thank you so All much. Right, for right, it's great to see you. Great having you. Yes. Thank uh, you. Thank you guys very thanks, much. Buddy. Hope to do it again soon. Yes. Have a good flight. Thank All you. Right, thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Um, there's one of one topic I did want to mention here. There is actually two. Um, one is that if you if you play with AI coding assistance, um, which I've been really into playing with lately, um, I know you were a trailblazer uh, uh, <laughs> with uh, Ian with um, Tab Nine back in the day, um, but now I've been playing with a lot of them, including Tab Nine. Um, and uh, but uh, Devbox Genie is a good one if you if you use oh. any any JetBrains project. Um, okay. It's by uh, Stephen Jensen, who's the the head of Devbox, the initial Devbox Belgium conference and the Devbox uh, conference and the Devbox brand. But what's great about it, it doesn't do sort of the, the code completion sort of stuff, although I think they're starting to add that now. But you can use any model you want. You can pick, you know, open API, nice. Gemini, uh, you can do um, uh, uh, cloud ones, um, whatever, whatever model you want. You can just bring your API key. You don't have to pay for any service. It's open source. Um, and it does open. It does it does um, offline models um, using Olama or oh, nice. what is it like? Uh, there's a there's another there's a couple other ones that do no. offline models. Just um, in case you can't be online, yeah. Yeah, and I've I've been playing with Olama a lot, and I already had it installed, and it just magically knew it was there, and I was able to pick like a couple different models. Um, and what's cool is you can see how good or bad they are. at Your question, um, and also nice. how slow they are on your machine um, when you run them locally. But to me, this opens up. Um, there are there are a couple other tools that will do offline models, like um, Tab Nine, I think, does now, and I think um, uh, what is it, Sourcecraft Cody does. But um, but I like the idea of doing my my models locally because then I can actually do work on it for client work and stuff. I don't have to yep. worry about you know uh, right, right, right. liabilities. Um, so uh, so Devbox Genie is really cool because it's really flexible too. So. Nice. Well, yeah, that's when, a big thing. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go. Oh, no, I was just, just going to say, well, <laughs> you go first. Yeah, no, your turn. You go ahead. I've been taking up way too much bandwidth already, so it's it's on you. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> All right, just real quick comment. I, I think that's important that you can run the things locally because there are a lot of corporate environments and organizations yeah. that don't want you actually talking to chat GPT 4.0 or something like that or running your code buy some, you know, uh, AI that's out there on, you know, exactly. host on some other server. So if you can run it locally, it's a, it's always a good option. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a great point. I was just going to make the flip, the flip argument, which is the other option too, is to get your, your client or get the organization to onboard with an enterprise AI product. That way it's already approved and mm -hmm. 
they they have like um, you know the, the, uh, a siloed environment, or if they're just using the cloud offering gener yeah. generic uh, okay. product, for example, like GitHub Copilot, right? Then now you get the benefit of getting the whole development team using the AI mm -hmm. to write the code. And we yeah. talked coming back to like unit testing, how how much of a chore it is for developers. Well, guess what? It's not a chore for the AI. So AI loves to, AI coding assistants <laughs> love to spit out unit test code. So all you have to do is tell it, write a test for this this class. Okay, boom, 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 yeah, boom, boom. It's, it's, it's usually not the best. Out. It's usually not the best code at first. It's not bad though. You can AI yeah, it's probably a good starting point. Yeah. You you know, with two or three steps, you copy paste that code. You, you can see it's like it doesn't know what instance variables or services are injected into the test uh, case itself. So it, it's assuming like you have some service that gives you some data, it sees the context. It doesn't know how you got that service into the class in the first place. So there's some you know minor rework needed, I find. But after that, a couple of small fine replacements and some basic refactoring, and then you've got like pretty much co complete tests. It was really interesting. I was running some AI generated unit test code and it started touching code, like I also run with test coverage. That's very important because then you'll see how much of my tests are, how much of my code is actually being tested. Yeah. How much coverage do I have, mm -hmm. right? The green bar and the red bar on the side in the, in the gutter in the yeah. intelligence. And then you can see, so what happened is it started testing some code that had never really been tested before. That green bar kept growing and growing and growing and it just started covering the entire method. And it was like, wow, that's really interesting. We never saw this code, uh, reacting under tests before and notice that like there was probably some issue in that code so yeah how how yeah. just a question about that how is the ai with generating ui test code test cases so well That's ui tests question. we're talking about like you know component level or, or service level angular type of test cases yeah. right which is ui code yeah. but as far as writing like a cypress test you could, you could write, it can auto-complete for you, for example, right? Like we use, I use a lot of Cypress for the browser automation, like end-to-end -end testing, right? In Angular, you have like unit testing and end-to-end -end testing. Mm -hmm. Unit testing is Karma and Jasmine. Eventually they're moving to Jest and, and you can, that's on their roadmap. Uh, Karma is kind of a deprecated framework, but that's basically your job, your um, browser, it's like runs in a headless browser. So it, it just calls your components and your services and it's like, it's in your typical white box testing, right? So you you call a service, you pass in a parameter, you expect to get a result back. You know mm -hmm. how it works. You know how the code works. So you're able to test the internals of your code, right? Uh, but yeah, as far as end-to-end -end testing, there's more black box testing where you don't know like how the application is implemented. You just know there's a user interface. There's some buttons on the screen. You automate clicking this, clicking that. So uh, to me, the UI, like, so the AI would probably, I haven't used it to write the Cypress code, but I use the auto completion feature almost continuously. So, and I probably have used it to generate Cypress code before. So I, I think it's fine, but I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I, I think we, Josh would have to look into that one. Yeah, that, that is a good yeah. question. I think the use case is a little bit harder to determine in that scenario, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's where you can uh, maybe scale back from having it write 30 lines of code to having it write maybe five lines of code at the same time, right? Or two or three lines of code, like go back to auto completion mode. Uh, but as far as like the, the mundane stuff, like writing the unit tests, like um, sure. you were talking about earlier, I mean, it's it's great for that. Like, it's really great. I should try it for more than that because what I've tried, I haven't been too happy with, but, but I, should, I should actually do it more in earnest with the unit That's tests. What else I liked is that, you know, for because we were trying to take a really pedantic approach to introducing unit testing to the team. So we put a lot of comments in the code and say like, uh, arrange, act, await, assert, for example, right? So you do your arrange step, you set up your, your, your test fixture, you set up your mock data, then you, you do some action, you invoke a method or something and you, you wait for it for a synchronous event to finish and then you assert something, right? So we'd have like this four step you know, a rate, I just found some tutorials online that's basically how they were doing it. So, but then you, you rate the code with the AI and it's like, no, it doesn't bother with any of that formality. It does those things, but it, it does it in a more economical way, like in a, a more concise way. So it's great because you usually, you know, it does some setup code, it executes something, then it writes some assertion. So it's, it's pretty simple yeah. and it's clean and it's, it's, you can see, and it's not production code. There's no risk that you're going to, let AI write some code that's going to create a bug in production, right? Let's you can review it too, like obviously. 
right? So you're reviewing the test case that it's writing. Some of it might not be useful, right? But it does generate, like we said, the positive negative scenarios, failure and success cases. Right, and um, you've, you've it, got some decent scaffolding to begin with, which is very nice. Uh, yep. I I should say that I, I do agree with you, Ian, that like, if you, it is better for the organization to actually have number one, a policy for how to work with these tools. And number two, hopefully some internal implementation if they've decided they want to embrace them, whether it's Copilot or, you know, yeah. Catamine or whatever, whatever it is. And a lot of them, a lot of them have like really, um, some of them will even do on-prem on -prem installs of the exactly. software and stuff. So um, yeah, so I agree with you there. Um, it's a great tool. I mean, it really can help overall, like think about it, if developers have, they only have X amount of bandwidth. So are, are you gonna spend, like uh, take that precious bandwidth that they have and ask them to write unit tests, which to an organization might not have obvious value, even though, yeah, if you're if you're a seasoned, um, uh, you know, if you're a veteran of the industry and you know how important testing is, and yeah, you might put place value, but someone from an IT background might recognize that as being highly valuable. But to, to a business person who, wants to see the new feature rolled out so the users start uh, engaging with it, like they're not gonna immediately see value in, in having the team spend, you know, 50% more time writing unit tests. Yeah. They wanna see that code, they don't want any delays in, in, in the shipping of that, the features, right? So yeah, this way it's like you offload that burden to the AI, let it write the unit test. Obviously code review the heck out of that code, but it's done most of the work for you. So how can, where's the excuse now? Like. Why aren't you testing your code? <laughs> That's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we should probably wrap, wrap up. I'm just looking at how long we've been on. <laughs> so uh, you guys okay with going to the picks? Sure, just one more thing to mention real sure. quick. Sure. Uh, by the time everybody listens to this, uh, JDK 23 will most likely either be out or be very close to be released. So just a quick mention there. Yes. And it's okay to use it. Yes, <laughs> it is okay to use it, man. Just the uh, yeah, the LTS stuff just keeps coming up, and just like, oh, I'm not gonna use it to LTS. Uh, There's no difference between any of the versions, they're all quality versions, or and you don't get anything unless you pay for it. Uh, the yeah. LTS is a meaningless label unless money's coming out of your pocket and you need someone to support you, right? If you're not paying for Java, Java VM support from Oracle or Azure or somebody else. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about LTS it. LTS is meaningless. Yep. Enough said. All right, picks. Uh, Lenny had a pick. Um, I have two picks. Uh, one is the JVM Weekly Newsletter. Um, I've recently gotten into newsletters because I, I, I subscribe to um, uh, Ken Paulson's newsletter. And then I think because it's on Substack, I got hooked into this one and then another one. Um, and so JVM Weekly, it's like every week it has all these great little tidbits about, you know, just stuff in the, the JVM ecosystem um, and includes stuff about also about uh, WorldVM and uh, Quarkus and stuff like that, Spring Boot, whatever. Um, and it's just, just a handy, handy uh, way to get some updates on the JVM ecosystem. So you should check that one out. Um, nice. nice. My second pick is that if you're on a Mac if, and if you're on a Mac laptop, like a MacBook or MacBook Pro, and if you find it getting hot, there's a great tool I found called Max Fan Control, um, which lets you control the fans in the Mac because by default they're set to like not make any noise, so that your laptop gets hot. Um, you know, obviously it's not overheating because if it's going to overheat, the fans would actually come on. Mm -hmm. But it's not comfortable if it's sitting on your lap. So Max Fan Control lets you basically change, turn the fans on or off, um, or have them. Uh, turn on when the temperature of any particular system component gets to a certain level, um, which is awesome. Uh, and if you pay like five bucks, you get five or 10 bucks. I can't remember. Um, you can save defaults, which is what I did. Cause... You know, you're not supposed to use laptops on your lap. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Everybody knows of this. <laughs> uh, I got I got a question for you too, um, Keto, on that. And yeah. What about uh, switching from, are you running a, like a M1 or M, M2 Mac or? It's an M1 Max. It's an M1. Okay, okay. Because yeah. that, that already makes a huge difference, right? Oh, from it did. It, it was great for a while. And then then after, maybe it's gotten warmer this year. Maybe it's because of the heat. I don't know what it is. Or I know what it is. I think I've just been sitting with it on my lap more this year. 
That's what it is. I think you're just developing more code. Your thing's working harder. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> Maybe it's all, it's all the AI models. That's what's coming. Yeah, that uh, could be. Yes. That could be. Uh, that's it. Uh, I, I, was, yeah. I was amazed, though. I have uh, like a 2019 Mac Pro. This thing, you know, is belching out heat like you wouldn't believe, right? <laughs> and there's massive fans in that thing. And um, mm. it, it's running at about like 450 kilowatt hours a, a, of con energy consumption, right? So that that's a lot like uh you know that's half a kilowatt basically that's a lot of energy to use mm -hmm. and the mac, the mac uh like i have an m3 macbook pro uses about up to 90 so it's sometimes it's hovering around 30 or 40 kilowatt hours right so it, it uses a fraction of the the energy and i'd recently swapped them out and i thought can i power my whole like you know desktop setup with uh like two displays all this stuff with uh uh, with my laptop and I did and it's like wow this uses like you know a quarter of the energy that my Mac Pro is using mm -hmm. just as powerful Intel versus uh, you know ARM64 yeah. uh, architecture pretty amazing but it, yeah, it still definitely helps indeed fan control is still important I have a cooling a cooling tablet with the fan pushing the air up onto the Mac ah. they, run, they run with the clam, in clamshell mode they run really well actually now the new MacBooks like hook up external displays to it and and close the lid and it just runs like a desktop it's great yeah i don't ever open my mac it's all it's underneath my bar i i, I still Shot. i use i use that screen as another screen now so uh i, I like having that's useful up. sometimes i you know i flip up the lid you can even have like your your ipad sit on your desk and have like if you have two displays you can add your macbook as a third one and your, yeah, your iPad yeah. fourth one send the window all the way across to the iPad. And it's like, mm -hmm. okay, I don't want to look at that right now. I'll put that on the side. Speaking yeah. of which, uh, I don't want to that, that derail, but I, I wanted to raise this point before you know we, we, we wrap up. Anybody looked at the uh, new Apple VR headset for work? Has anyone considered using that? No. I thought about the possibilities of having it and attending meetings and being in you know close, proximity with others you know virtually with this thing and in the future i think it will be a, a really amazing thing to have but i've never used one and i'm not exactly sure how far it goes right now right. can yeah. you imagine this though okay imagine you're you're in a hotel in some exotic you know place on a, on a vacation you need you, you want to check in on your, your project put on this headset your entire like room now becomes a display so you have like windows everywhere You've yeah. got like uh, literally like the whole your whole visual field of view becomes your your office space and you can it's got the AR knob so you can like toggle between uh, VR and AR so basically sure. you can fade out the real world and put like a virtual background like we have on on our behind us or you can go like fifty percent so you have augmented reality so you have like windows floating against an, the actual mm -hmm. room background. Uh, but, or, you know, when you're on a train or a plane, you want to check out your work. Can you imagine having like two displays on a plane? You're sitting working at your, that would be awesome. you know, your seat and you have two yeah. big displays in front of you. Anyway, VR would be great. Or it'd be interesting yeah. for coding, right? If the, it's supposed to be like uh 19, what is that? Like uh two, two K display quality. So visually, I think would be sharp enough for, a, you know, for an IDE screen, but anyway, yeah. I was just curious yeah. if you guys thought about that yeah i no. think it will be that's yeah, an interesting awesome. point so that way like on an airplane uh you don't have to lift the lid and like run danger of like the back seat when they recline to crush your crush your screen <laughs> just keep it keep it closed uh attach a keyboard to it and just have your yeah. vr uh headset on yeah. there and uh sure yeah get to work or watch movies uh exactly. make everyone jealous that sounds great watch <laughs> movies like the you're at the theater the big yeah screen. yeah yeah. Yeah. Well, well, let us know when you get one in the end. You can give us the demo. Oh, it's food for thought. Okay. I, I'm I'm exploring the idea. I'm just wondering if I want, like, it does catch you off a little bit from the outside world. I mean, I've used VR for for gaming before, yeah. and it, it's intense. Like you you can you know like it's really intense. It's visceral. It's a visceral experience. Oculus so, or it was no. actually a PS PS4 VR. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, you're uh, talking about something else. Sorry. Yeah, we, but we, it was pretty cool. Have... Like you. You know the shark experience. It's like you're they're lowering you in a in a cage into the shark infested waters, and there's like <laughs> sharks coming up, swimming around. Look around. There's a shark behind you and stuff. 
Pretty cool. I, I know we, we, we have an Oculus, which I've only yeah. used a little bit in order basically to configure it enough for my son to play. Um, and I, I was pretty impressed with it. But um, but sometimes there have been times where like I, I hear all this noise and I come down and it's just him on with the headset on. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, what's going on here? <laughs> you know? Yeah, my so, son has one. And uh, we did the Space Station uh, app. And it immenses you're 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 completely uh, immensed into this experience because in, with the space station you use the joysticks, and you can like float around in this thing and go through all the tunnels and there's even like a keyboard like a laptop you can pull down and start typing on and that's awesome it's crazy yeah it is really neat I like that all right I'm I'm gonna look for that one that sounds like fun so all right Josh what's your pick. So this is not a pick that has to do with anything uh, tech related, unless you're interested in going onto a website or downloading an app and uh, using it. Uh, but definitely something you may want to try out on the weekend if you like to have a cocktail every once in a while. Uh, I do like to indulge in a cocktail every once in a while. I have actually a home bar where I collect different bottles of different things got uh, quite a few ingredients. This app is called Make Me a Cocktail, and it is a uh, good place that you can uh, catalog everything that you have. So, every, you know, oh. from gin to vodka, different kinds to your bitters and all of this. So you, you put all of your ingredients in here. It's got a slew of uh, recipes that you can try, like almost every recipe. I have found a couple here and there, cocktails that are not there, uh, but just about everything is there. If you're looking for a gin-based cocktail, you can find all the gin-based, vodka, whatever. Uh, and the cool thing is uh, they've got this mode called uh, Make Me a Cocktail, uh, Surprise Me. You click this thing and whatever you've got in your recipes uh, or in your, excuse me, in your home bar, it will take and it will just give you like roulette and it will give you a cocktail you can make. So wow. if you're home on the weekend and you're just looking to try something new, you can surprise me and get something and it will show you how to make it, what you need to have. It's pretty cool. Uh, nice. And the other thing I like about it is that I can, I can, uh, you know, uh, plus the recipes, the cocktails I like, mm. and I can also leave comments and things. So it's pretty slick. That's cool. Awesome. I'm I love the idea of being able to pick to say these are the things I have and then tell want to tell me what I can do. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty neat. Yeah, it's a good way to catalog what you've got. And then you can also, if you're looking to get more things, or if you want if there's cocktails that you want to try, it will tell you what you're missing. And you can be at the store or whatever if you buy online. However, cool. then you know what you need to buy. It's nice. nice. I need a, I need to put some work into I have the I have the Dean Martin effect where I enjoy drinking, but it's it's always with so, you know social. I never just like I'm going to make a drink like the old '70s show where they open the globe and pour themselves a drink after a meeting or whatever. Like I don't do that. I don't do sure. that at all. Uh, and so I'll go on like months without drinking. But everyone thinks I'm a heavy drinker uh, just because like in, in a social area, I'm just like I always have a drink in my hand, uh, which is uh, the Dean Martin story because Dean Martin used to go to Johnny Carson and look like man that dude is savage. He is just always 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 drinking. Uh, but his his children are like, nah, he didn't even drink at all. Um, <laughs> just like, but like I have a, a because people think I'm always like, you know, <laughs> heavily into it. I have so many bottles back here. I have like a backlog of things. So uh, maybe I'll chip away at it. But again, you know, if I don't if I don't have friends here, then it's usually not my thing. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. All right, this is Dana. great, Josh. I, I'm you know over the pandemic, I got into make, mixing cocktails as well for my wife and I. And uh, definitely, I set a goal. I was like, I want to learn 50 unique cocktails. So I, I did it. Yeah. Like, nice. Yeah. And uh, I, it was a great experience. Like, you know, it taught me a lot about mixology, about like uh, balance. You know, you got sweet ingredients, you got sour ingredients, you got, you got spirits. You're trying to create a balance and it's, and like with citrus and like all these interesting ingredients. So bitters and, and syrups. And it's, it's really an interesting stuff, actually. It really like, is. That's, that's where I'll, I'll make a pick here. Paper Plane is one of the best cocktails. I'm going to put number one I've ever had. Ooh, Paper oh, Plane cool. is it. It's called Paper Plane. What's in that? Is that oh, a yeah. gin-based? Aperol. I just checked it out here and make me yeah. a cocktail. And there it is. <laughs> uh, Paper Plane. Very cool. Aperol, the, Aperol uh, Amaro, yeah. bourbon, and lemon juice. Very cool. Yeah. 
Okay, bourbon. Okay. Yeah, and then the Amaro, uh, I got, uh, it was an Amaro that was uh, uh, not Montenegro, but the other one. Amaro Nonino is the one that I use. Hmm. Uh, and I've never purchased uh, an, ex well, I purchased some expensive bottles, but this one, this Amaro is like over $60, so prepare for that, oh, but it makes yeah. a good drink. This is great. Oh, I'm going to add this to my favorites, uh, Dan. Yeah. yeah. Nice. You won't have other cocktails. Hey, Just one quick tip, too. I, I have been buying fresh mint and very hard to keep fresh mint oh, yes. fresh because that thing, you know, a week or two in the fridge and they're all ruined. Yeah. And so what I found, and, and I never used them well, I like to have mojito or um, a mint julep. And what I found is the best is you infuse that mint into your simple syrup. Uh, yes. You just make your own simple syrup, put the mint in there, and it is great because then you just put an ounce of this uh, simple syrup with the mint in it, a couple ounces of your uh, rum, and top it off with club soda, and you're good to go. So you got a nice. mojito. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. All right. That's all for me. Yep. Thank you. Excellent. I, I think I'm going to have to make a cocktail after this. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Good idea. Anna, what you got for us? All right. Um, I'm going to be uh, uh, creating a uh, workshop on October. Let's see. I think I put it in the calendar for No Fluff, Just Stuff. Uh, we're I'm going to do a uh, a free uh, seminar uh on oh no it's not it's going to be a different topic yeah it's going to be on java gatherer so i just thought i'd announce that so if you're interested in learning about the new i think jdk 23 that's going to come out in preview on uh on jdk mm -hmm. gatherers so uh awesome. if you're interested i think this uh, podcast will be out before then so on october 11th at 11 a.m mountain time uh i'll be giving a, a free seminar for that are you gonna uh, but one of the other talks i was i'm uh working on uh and i'll probably include it in my next gen testing since we're we're talking about uh testing um my pick will be jquick uh if you've not heard of that that is a property-based testing so rather than you create the inputs manually uh this will create the inputs for you hmm. uh and not only that it will uh, create, um, you know, jerk inputs. <laughs> I say it that way because what it'll do is they'll throw in like max value and negative uh, min value in, and zero and like all this crap at, you know, at your code. So that way, you know, you think you covered all your inputs, but you really haven't because the, the computer is going to generate that for you. Uh, and it's really great. Uh, the only thing you have to do is really twist your mind uh, in a in a different sort of way and find uh, find properties and ways that you can define properties based on the inputs. Because one of the things you don't want to do is you don't want to redevelop your production code as a test. So you don't want to do that. You just really want to slam your production code uh, using these particular properties. So for example, uh, like absolute value, let's choose something easy. For whatever number I give, I should always have a positive out of it, right? That's a property. Uh, that I'm stipulating. I'm not saying anything about the inputs or what it is. It's just that when I run this through ABS, everything should be positive. And those are the things that I'm finding on there. Anyway, I'm um, uh, I'm uh, experimenting with using jQuick with test containers because test containers bring up any kind of database. But how do we test against the database? I got tired of like creating fake records uh, and running it through my you know repository or my DAO. And that was getting tedious. And I'm like, yeah, let's just use jQuick for it because it just creates, and you can use something called arbitraries to create custom objects for you. So if I create five objects uh, and, or if I create one object, I should be able to recall that object from a database. If I create five objects uh, with, you know, a certain uh, value into it, I should be able to recall those back from the database. Or if I create, five values where let's say the title has the word uh, Bob in it, uh, or let's say three out of five have the word Bob in it, then I should get three back because I know how much I put in and I know how much of those Bobs I put in. So all those are properties that you could use. So I'm just gonna try to mix these in with uh, jQuick and test containers. So that way, you know, could show others and I learned along the way myself on how to use property-based testing along with databases. So that way you don't have to create those darn you know, fake data, uh, you just uh, have jQuick generate that for you. That nice. Cool. 
Yeah, that sounds good. All right, thanks, Dana. Cool. Yep. Uh, Ian. Hey, I already gave my pick earlier with the yeah. homolytics. So, but uh, yeah, that one, I just wanted to say uh, so far, I'm very happy with the result moving off of uh, CentOS. Literally, it's hit, like hitting a brick wall. You have all this, like, you know, this, these infrastructure containers running and like you need to update something, there's a security update running some app in, in a container. Now, like you can't, you can't do it. Like literally I had to shut down some, some applications I was running in house for my own, you know, side project stuff. And it's, it's like, man, what, what are you supposed to do? So a lot of developers, I think we were all just kind of, you know, willfully ignorant of the reality that sooner rather than later, uh, you know, plug is going to get pulled and no more sent to us seven. So, but yeah, I, I'm on, you know, moved off to Alma Linux uh, and I'm, I'm really happy with it so far. I looked at Rock, uh, Rocky Linux as well, which um, it looked interesting, but I, I think, you know, Alma Linux uh, had the right, you know, the right uh, community kind of approach that I was looking for. So yeah, I, I'm really happy with the results so far. Uh, but yeah, what else? Uh, that's basically, that was one of my picks. The other one was the um, uh, Swift testing. So I do a lot, like a little bit of Swift programming on the side. And uh, this was for me an interesting, uh, I, I, I don't have experience with it, so I can't really say I've used it and I recommend it, but it had a, a really interesting kind of uh, appeal to me because uh, I can see it's like a first party test framework coming from Apple. So whenever Apple does mm -hmm. something, especially for developers, it's it's interesting to look at it because they really understand user experience. They really understand human machine interface guidelines and they know how to design and build beautiful software for, for end users, right? And when the end user is a developer, they am always intrigued to see like, how do they approach testing, right? So, uh, and yeah, sure enough, it, it looks pretty cool. Like um, it's a declarative com combining like a you know, declarative approach with uh, imperative approach. So it's kind of taking like the BDD style of having your test specification as a, as, a, as basically text and executing that, but using um, like these, uh, these decorators. So, uh, but yeah, test Swift testing is, is a new framework uh, from Apple for, for testing uh, Swift code. And guys, I have to say, like, I've been doing some Swift programming now for a few years and I'm really happy with it. Like uh, the experience has been great. I, mm -hmm. I really enjoy you know, working with, with Swift, um, it's a beautiful language. Like it's one of those languages that, you know, when you write some code in it and you look at it afterwards and you think like, wow, this is just a really elegant language. Like mm -hmm. sometimes Java feels like that too, right? You write some code and you're just like, wow, the, to imagine the what's really going on. It's like three or four lines of code. There's so much going on here. And this language is so powerful and expressive that, you know, uh, like, especially with the streams API, I found with Java streams, uh, once you start chaining together these, like creating these pipelines with your MapReduce style, like um, uh, transformations, right? That, that's where you start to see the power of an expressive language. But anyway, so Swift testing, some new new uh, uh, test framework coming from Apple. Uh, if anybody's doing any any Swift programming, you might be interested in, in looking at that. I, I discovered it through, again, through my participation with this uh, open source project for the Cucumber uh, Swift implementation and the uh, the maintainer mentioned that this is this is coming uh, coming up and that you know we should align with that that framework. Right. So very nice. cool. Yeah, look, it looks beautiful. Um, I have a question. Uh, have you used Vapor? No, I have. Swift? I haven't used Vapor at okay. all. Yeah, no, I, I looked at that a little bit as well. And if you like Swift, that's a good one for the you know developing web applications. Hmm. Interesting. That's for like for server side Swift, right? Okay. It's like okay. Ktor or something for you know for um, Kotlin. Nice. Know. Yeah, it's pretty Swift. Uh, Swift. Yeah, it's pretty slick. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, vapor dot codes, right? I like that. Yeah. I mean, I've not done a lot with it, but I do like Swift as well. I I wish I had a little more time to deal with it and to work with it and learn more. But I did look at Vapor because I'm mostly mostly into developing web applications and it yeah, looked, yeah. looked like a nice one. Yeah, I mean, from, you know, yeah, this is great. I mean, Swift on the server is brand new for me. I don't have much experience with that. But from, from the UI perspective, right, writing UI code with Swift is great because like the UI, yep. UI testing capabilities are great. And the, the like, um, Apple really knows how to build 
a decent, you know, developer experience focused tool like Xcode for all its limitations, you know, it was for me, it was really sad when JetBrains pulled the plug on Opcode because I, I relied on that tool. Oh, they, I was, they killed that one? Oh yeah. Oh, wow. it's, gone. it's gone. Yeah, that, they, wow. And one of the reasons they killed it is because Apple introduced uh, Swift UI previews and they just, they couldn't, they can't even re-implement that. Like they're trying to keep some kind of feature parity with Xcode. But when Xcode introduced Swift UI previews, which is basically like, if you ever worked with um, uh, probably with NetBeans or even Eclipse to some extent doing any kind of swing development, you can remember there's like a split screen view where you can see mm -hmm. like a preview of your swing UI. Yeah, and you have your code, and that's that's what Swift UI previews is, is like, right? So you have like a, a actually functional rendered uh, view of your UI as you're writing the code. So it's like that split screen, almost like a the WYSIWYG style thing, like with the yeah. Dreamweaver. Just did. And that was one of the things I liked the most about Dreamweaver too, is that that split screen preview mode, uh, yeah. because you get into that flow state. And I know uh, you know Lenny was talking about he doesn't like flow because it takes him away from his family, but you know, if you're if you're in the zone, like if you're creating and you you're a creative person, you want to get into that flow state and stay in that state for a while. Like that's to me, that's like it's a great tool for that because of those split screen design development modes where you're like you're doing like you're writing code, but you're also seeing what you're you resolved right away. I think that's great. Like to me, that's the Zen of of programming. Right? The, yeah. the, uh, like that Zen state of like this is great. Like uh, you know, my ideas are just materializing as fast as I can come up with them. And, uh, and and Swift gives you that experience. Like that's one thing I really appreciate about about Swift is that you you get that instant uh, you know gratification of seeing what you're writing translate into UI. So yep. to me, that's the fun part. Nice. Excellent. All right. So let's uh, let's jump to events and uh, send our listeners on their way. Yeah. Um, uh, and and meet my my imaginary cocktail. Um, all right, so uh, there's actually a decent number of conferences this fall. Um, so jconf.dev um, is going to be September 24th to 26th in Dallas, Texas. And this is from, I think this is from uh, the DevOps guys, right? If mm -hmm. I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, so this is from Vita Pratik, who do DevOps and some other conferences. That's um, DevNexus, right? DevNexus, I'm sorry. Yes, I no, always okay. do that for some reason. Yes, DevNexus, star stuff. Um, <laughs> and uh, September 19th through 20, there's Code.Talks in Hamburg, Germany. Um, I have not been to this one, um, but I think this is more uh, different topics. Uh, tech event for developers and CTOs. Um, Vincots. Dev to Next um, is going to be September 30th through October 3rd in Lone Tree, Colorado, in the U.S. And I, I will not be there. Uh, well, you'll be there, right, Dana? I will be. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so uh, Vingat Super Supermanian's first conference, um, which uh, looks amazing. So, um, and there's still tickets available now. Um, for, I think for all of these. So. Hopefully, when this comes out, it'll still be. I think this will come out before the conference, but I've said that before, and it never seems to happen. <laughs> so, um, but you should definitely check that one out if you uh, if you want to see Dano and a whole bunch of other um, uh, sort of industry experts uh, mm -hmm. in 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 uh, Vincot's backyard. So, I mean, it's not literally his backyard, but just his general area. <laughs> right. So. Um. And then we've got DevOx Morocco, October uh, 2nd through 4th. And that really is DevOx, not DevNexus. Um, and DevOx Belgium, October 7th through 11th in Antwerp, Belgium. Code Motion Milan, October 22nd through 23rd in Milan, Italy. Um, and I have not been to that one either. Um, Dan, I want to take us through the uh, NFGS ones. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I guess we don't need this August one. We've already had one. Yeah, because the August one is uh, going to be coming up. Uh, let's see. Well, I'll, I'll just talk about it. Okay. Uh, September 5th through 6th, even though it's coming up by the time you hear this, that won't be there. But uh, we'll be uh, at uh, Nova, Northern Virginia. Um, I don't know if this, I, I doubt this one will come out either. But just in case, uh, we can reminisce about what happened. 
<laughs> uh, but Central Iowa in Des Moines, September 12th through 13th. Uh, DevOps Vision, though, uh, December 2 through 4th. I have uh, two workshops that I'm pushing right now. So uh, it's, uh, uh, I'm kind of happy right now. Just, uh, I'm creating workshops. Uh, and uh, I, I know these topics, but you know, there's always different things about it that you should really yeah. know about. So uh, yeah. one is just going to be standard operations on how to go from code and, and do that check-in and how to do continuous delivery and deployment. So I'll have a half day workshop for that. And then I'll have another uh, workshop on uh, doing ML ops and how to get your machine learning models uh, deployed. So two workshops there and I have a few other things uh, going on for uh, DevOps division. Tech Leader Summit, uh, that one is for uh, technical leaders. Uh, I'm not in that one. <laughs> and uh, ArchConf, which is the uh, architecture uh, conference uh, where we talk about uh, everything architecture. I have like about six uh, presentations there. I have a, a, a fairly, I put a lot of effort into it and it's, it's a lot of fun to do. Uh, put a lot of effort into architectural design patterns. Uh, and um, it was, I run out of time so much that we broke it up into uh, other topics. So um, I'll be doing that, but another, again, a lot of other great speakers there as well. So hope you could make it over there. Clearwater, Florida in December. So if you're in Minnesota or Michigan or Ohio and already got too cold for you, uh, then come on down. <laughs> yeah, that makes a little sense. Hey, uh, Josh, you want to do the last couple ones? Sure. So Jakarta One live stream is going to be December 3rd. This is the uh, online conference that you want to catch if you're into Jakarta EE, for sure, or MicroProfile. Uh, and then also uh, we have the J Champions Conference, which is happening in January the 23rd, 24th, 27th, and 28th. So it kind of spans two weeks, uh, just uh, Thursday, Friday, and then uh, Monday, Tuesday. And the J Champions Conference, if you haven't heard of it before, is all Java champions. All the all the sessions are great, and so it's definitely recommended and online as well. Yeah, and it's, it's that one's it's free, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, um. Yeah. So I think both of those are free. So free conference is good. <laughs> that's that's true, and then it's also great that you can interact uh, with the presenters you know, uh, by chatting. And usually there's a moderator like in the in the J Champions Conference so they can ask questions. It's almost like being there, you know, uh, with the Java Champion and, and they're usually pretty nice. Yep. Yep. All right. And busy fall for conference goers. Good deal. That's good. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I think we've come to it at the end of another long stocked episode. Um, so I want to thank everybody for listening. And if you made it this far, um, I, I, I think you're amazing. Um, yeah. And also always, we create, uh, these are really long. So that way they could help you uh, along the uh, dry months where we don't have another uh, podcast. So exactly. You can always listen follow, and down payments. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so you can find us on stackedpodcast.com, S-T-A-C-D podcast.com. And in your favorite podcast app, I was happy to, to show my kids they could find me in Spotify. Um, and uh, yeah. uh, and feel free to give us a, a rating, a five-star rating, of course. But, That's uh, right. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. It's been fun having you. Um, and uh, we will see everybody else again next, next hopefully next month. Oh. <laughs> so, see you later, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.